Oh yeah, we got it overturned. <laughs> You're listening to the e inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. location with the men and women of law enforcement. All suspects are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. After I left uh, Midtown North in 88 and I was able to get into uh, ESU, so we did the, the trainings out at Floyd Bennett Field. So back when I did the training, it was only six weeks. Um, currently today, it's six months. So what they would do is you would do your six weeks by the time it was all done, so they, they would send you out. And then if there was a spot open for your EMT cl- class, they'd bring you back in. That'd be another three weeks. The same thing with scuba certification. They'd bring you, you know, wherever you did your diving, they would, they would bring you back. Now what they've done is just made it all one shot, you know, so you, you go down there and you do it. Um, but two truck was, again, was just great. Um, had uh, from 57th Street up to the George Washington Bridge um, and water to water. And it was, you had the run of it all and you, you police, you know, you responded to everything that happened there as well as citywide, um, you know, because there was, you, you may have four guys working in one truck and four guys working in two truck, something happens, you're going to, they're going to respond up, but you're going to respond down. So we'll back little for a second before we dive deeper into your ESU tenure. How, I know you mentioned doing the training at Floyd Bennett Field, which is a requirement for all E-men and women. Uh, how did the opportunity to join ESU open up? Again, uh, just kind of weird. We were standing around um, in Midtown North, mm-hmm. and uh, my, my soon-to-be partner in emergency service, George Manning, was, he said, well, I'm going to um, take uh, an interview for ESU. And we're like, well, oh, that sounds good. I said, never really thought about it. And I go back to, you know, who? I go back to my dad. And I said, you know, what about going to uh, ESU? And he says, well, we did have a friend who was a, uh, a lieutenant there, Lieutenant Harrigan, Harrington. And he said, let me call him up and uh, let's see what it's about. You know, so I, have, I had saw ESU on jobs. Um, I liked what they did. I thought they were consummate professionals. Um, so my father says, yeah, we got you an interview. So go see what they have. Um, so I was able to interview for it. And interesting. So when, when we interviewed back then, and, and basically what they told you said, well, why do you want to come to a unit that's kind of a dead end? You're not going to get a gold shield out of this. You're going to get dirty. There's really no overtime. There's no kind of, you know, what are you going to bring here for it? And, you know, you know, if you look at it now and they're getting the recognition that they definitely deserve, but it's a career path. You know, you're in the issue now, in 18 months, you get a gold shield. Back in the time when we first started it, it's like you, you're going to get dirty, you know, frustrated. You're not going to get much. Why? And, and yet we said, well, I want to do this. So I think and I, I could, there could be people that came before him, but uh, that, that kickstarted this trend. And if I missed them, then please tell me because I don't want to forget them and leave them out. But the guy that really kind of made it cool to be a detective in ESU from what I've read, and he'll, we'll talk about him later in the show, is Joe Vigiano. Because Joe was a guy, I mean, he worked out in Brooklyn. He got shot three times in the line of duty. He was working as a homicide detective mm-hmm. on, on one of the occasions. And he goes in the ESU. I mean, here's a guy that can go just about anywhere that has carte blanche because he's given so much and has nearly got killed on three separate occasions. And he goes to ESU where he has his gold shield. I think it was him that made it cool to, to go to, to a truck and, and get a gold shield. They, well, they were bringing them in. Um, even when I went there, it was basically one, one specialist detective shield per truck. 
So at least, you know, there's nine trucks. You only have nine of them. There's 250 people. So again, the career path wasn't there. Um, and Joe, and I know Joe from the time when I was in the 7.5. Um, and, and it was funny because he was, he was in the RIP unit as a white shield and he was getting his gold shield. And he said, well, I'm going to go to ESU. I go, you, you're on a career path somewhere completely different. Why? But it was something that, that he always wanted to do him as well as uh, Mike Hurt. Um, who was out there in the, in the 705 while I was out there was the as well. most common emergency to go to? Well, you know, uh, in Truck 6 area, we had, uh, you know, some bridge work. Uh, the Verrazano Bridge was a popular site for jumpers. Mm -hmm. And I can't even begin to tell you many times up on top of the girders of those bridges there. Something that was unique uh, that no other uh, truck unit had was, uh, was we had Coney Island. Mm -hmm. And Coney Island has the parachute jump. you know. And every July 4th, actually uh, between July 4th and the early mornings of July 5th, there was a, a, a man that was able to bypass police security because they got wise to it after a while and they would pull sentry around, around the uh, parachute jump. But he would climb to the top of that structure and place an um, humongous Puerto Rican flag. So in the morning now, all the, uh, you know, at the time, was, uh, you know, I guess it still is, uh, it's a very large Washington community. They'd be called to, to the police station, I have to support a Rican flag, you know? And uh, they would respond, verify, and guess who they would call to take it down? <laughs> so I, I had actually climbed up there, you know, on a couple of occasions with, with uh, you know, with, some, with a couple of the guys. And we kind of marked it up as a training exercise. And we'd have to climb to the top there and remove the flag, you know? So uh, just kind of a unique kind of thing, you know? But we had our share of, uh, you know, I think pretty much all the trucks had very similar type of jobs. Um, one truck might have a little more of one type as opposed to another, but pretty much it's all the same. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, uh, I used to watch the television show Cops. If you ever <laughs> yes. Um, no matter where in the country that they're filming, the jobs are almost identical. Right. You know, maybe domestic violence or you're getting to the most disturbed individual or, you know, man with a gun. So, you know, it just there's different volumes and different amounts of volume. You know, a thrill a minute. You were you were living the six o'clock news. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, and you go you ah, oh, it's true. You go from one assignment of going, to, you know, to the high risk warrant, going to somebody's door and that tactical application, with the ballistic vests on, the helmets, the machine guns, the battery ramps, the very next job maybe taking a cat out of the tree, which has happened over and again. Mm -hmm. So um, you are very a very diversified type of individual. And it gets to a point where you kind of <clears throat> realize that there's not too much that you can't handle. You know, so whatever they throw at you, like the song, the Pat Benatar song at the time, hit me with your best shot. Let me see if I can handle this. And, and you do. And you figure it out. And what I learned as a supervisor in Truck 6, as a sergeant in Truck 6, was um, I, had, I started to recognize certain officers had... Um, more aptitude for one particular assignment than another. So, for example, some officers were much more better um, at doing rescue work, whereas other officers might be a lot better with the gun work, you know, the machine guns and holding that and, and doing that type of work. So um, it would depend on, um, on the assignment and who I had before me, who I was working with that particular you know, tour of duty, but if it was a rescue, I knew some people had better aptitude with, with the ropes, how to make certain knots and how to secure people on, on harnesses. And I, I'd go for them because it was about the success of the job, ultimately, getting it done. And, and so but everybody had, uh, you know, was cross-trained. Um, I remember when I first got onto the job, well, an old time, it says, uh, all right, kid, that was talking about the big rescue truck. This side of the truck is for saving lives. And this side of the truck is for taking life under the right set of circumstances. You know, that's what all the guns were and all of that. Okay. So um, everybody was cross-trained uh, in that truck. In fact, as a sergeant, uh, I was responsible for chauffeurizing, what we would call chauffeurizing police officer in, in the emergency service unit in my squad. Chauffeurizing meaning uh, the chauffeur of the truck. So it's not just driving that big truck. That's just a very small part of it. The, uh, to be a chauffeur, you have to be qualified to know where every piece of equipment on that truck is. So on a job, when somebody comes running and says, uh, you know, um, uh, I don't know, give me a, a carabiner. Where are the carabiners? You know, so they have to know exactly where everything is on that truck. 
So, and it takes, sometimes it takes up to three or four weeks before they, you know, and that's studying every single day because they know they're going to get a test. I'm going to give you a test in three weeks. Hmm. You prepare for it. So right. studying for a test. So they know where every piece of equipment on that truck is. And, and everybody is cross-trained on every piece of equipment on that truck. As I said, some have a little bit of a, a better aptitude on one area of them. I would gravitate towards that on a particular job. Say, um, this is back in the late 90s. I mean, maybe they were test bombing or they were uh, they were cleaning up bomb sites in Puerto Rico. They actually had a test bomb field out in Puerto Rico. And there were a lot of protests going on about it. So we get a call. Um, this skinny little guy managed to squeak out of the window in the crown of the Statue of Liberty and he crawls onto the head onto her crown and he's hanging banners and flags and stuff all over the place and it's in the protest the, the, you know, the bomb site in Puerto Rico. So now we, we can't drive to the Statue of Liberty so I call for aviation to meet us at the Wall Street heliport and the harbor meets us and next you know we end up splitting teams and um, we're on we're on the way to the the Statue of Liberty, and I'm getting ready to rappel out of the, the, the helicopter. You know, that's it's either that way or we land and go up. There was no way we were rappelling out of the helicopter. There were like four foot seas in the Hudson. It was a windy, windy day. And I remember arguing with my sergeant the whole time, back and forth. You're not rappelling. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. You're not rappelling. I don't know what I'm doing. Back and forth, back and forth. Finally, we end up, we, we land. I grab a uh, equipment bag, gear bag bag of line and I run up and sure enough as I'm getting I mean it, it was tough we get up there and I see I stick my quick take a quick look into the head and it's surrounded with cops so I grab one of the security guys and um, he directs me up to the arm to the torch we have to crawl up to the torch we get out and at least I have eyes on so like I said my they used to call me chick so we're in this job now for about an hour or so trying to negotiate with this guy who wants to hear nothing so I, my sergeant called, chick, chick, come down to the head. So I go down to the head. So why he called me, I don't know, I think just to, to bust my chops. He says, all right, this is what we're going to do. I want you, we're going to go downstairs, and we're going to bring up some tools, and we're going to cut a hole in the head of the Statue of Liberty, and we're going to go up and get this guy. So now I lose it. I, mean, I was never disrespectful to a boss. I really wasn't disrespectful to him that day, but I lose it. I'm like, are you out of your effing mind? You think I'm going to cut a hole in the head of the Statue of Liberty to go and get this screwball off of here? I said, I don't care if he falls off right now. If you think I'm going to cut a hole in the head of the Statue of Liberty. So we're all yelling back and forth. The guy on the head starts yelling in, no, don't cut Liberty. Please don't cut Liberty. I'll come in. Next thing you know, he comes in. So I don't know if it was maybe hostage negotiation tactics that I, uh, maybe my yelling and screaming brought this guy in on his own, but they managed to bring him in by on his own. And then the, the was off right 70s now. and early 80s when you were in ESU, was it really hot? Was it particularly bad? It was, but the problem was, uh, not the problem, the problem, we solved the problem, I believe, because uh, we would go to the local uh, fire company, rescue company usually, and those are the ones that would uh, basically, if you want to say, be in competition. They would be the specialists coming from the fire department to the same emergency that the police emergency squad was going to. And uh, I would go in and uh, bring a laptop computer and show them different events uh, that we did and explain our, our focus and purpose. Uh, and that became even more important when I went to the bomb squad. But uh, several of the fellows that were in Rescue One were actually neighbors of mine uh, when I lived in the village of Freeport. And uh, when we got on the scene, I would say hello to them. The emergency cops would go, what are you talking to them for? I said, they're my neighbors. I said, I get along with them. I'll be the liaison. I had a similar incident, uh, well, I would say after I was in emergency about seven years. They had a fire in a high rise in Midtown. And uh, we responded to the scene because the they were saying that people might be trapped in the elevators. When we got there, we started to work on the elevator door and uh, the fire department uh, had come in just before us. So we stood back and we let them operate. And they took out a giant uh, wooden crate, a big box, 
about three feet wide. And they opened it up and they had almost every elevator key in there that I had ever seen. <laughs> and I looked at it and the operator was getting up and he's taking a key and he's putting it through the, the keyway on the door. And he put it in and he turn, it wouldn't work. And he'd do another one, he'd do another one. So finally he puts a key in and he's turning it. And I said to him, you've got the right key, but this is a facade door, it's double thickness. You have to go further in. So he turns to me and he says, do you think you can open this door? I said, no, I know I can open the door. And he pulls his key out and he says, go ahead. So I walk over and I take a wire from a Z wire from my kit and I open it, push it up and I turn and push and open the door, open the door like this. And all of the rest of his company start laughing at me. And I turned around and then I closed the door. I said, now you can try it. Oh, his brothers, you know, his brothers and all, they said. So it was a great, great, great experience. I loved it, you know. So I, I was afraid of heights. So they had me jump out of a window backwards, 10 stories up. I feel that, that fear, you know. So I was on a, on, a, on a repel line, you know. Jumped out of helicopters with that job. We jumped out of helicopters on the roofs in Manhattan, you know, all that stuff, you know. Scuba diving, you did scuba diving. You went to school for psychological, uh, being, uh, they call it the P, uh, whatever the hell they used to call those things now. Uh, the psychological people, you just you know, learn quickly how to evaluate them and hopefully you'll be right, you know. Uh, you were an EMT. Everybody had to be at least an EMT. In fact, my one part, one of my partners, uh, Vic Politi, he was a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, you know, he, he helped out a lot. So. Uh, all kinds. You had the, the Hearst tool. You had uh, uh, special weapons. You had to be uh, proficient. You had to shoot expert with about ten different weapons, and uh, and you had to be good with it. Otherwise, you know, you never got that assignment. That was it. Uh, you did a lot of hits. We call hits where you're going to go in. You're going to do a raid. Mm -hmm. and anything can happen with that. You know, that was the most exciting part of the job. Doing doing a hit. When you kick a door, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's always like you know. So I can tell you stories on that, but uh, uh, this one guy I was talking to and before it hit and kept you know, joking around and stuff. And there was a song out, We Be Jamming, you know, We Be Jamming, you know. Yep. Anyway, we kicked the door open. The guy standing there with the gun, and I had my gun. I pointed the rifle at him, and I went, instead of saying, Police don't move, I just said, We Be Jamming. <laughs> he the gun. <laughs> and that was it. And that just came out of my mouth. I mean, you know, this was in my mind talking about it, you know. But, uh, you know, weird things happen, you know. So. Yankee Stadium in the Bronx was the meeting point to go and get Larry Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to hunt him down. He shot it out with the six cops. He injured them. He thankfully didn't kill them. He's a bad guy. He's rumored to have a hand grenade. He's holding a family hostage. The guy that he's holding hostage goes out, gets Richie, and says, he's in my apartment. Um so during the course of this manhunt, your blood's pumping. You got colleagues that are hurt. You got a real bad thug of a guy on the streets. How do you keep control in, a, in an emotionally charged situation like that? Uh, well, uh, that that evening, uh, we were on our way to one truck uh, from Brooklyn uh, to stop by. One of the one of the members was retiring. It was his last day, so we we're going to swing by and uh, wish him well. Hmm. We just looking for a parking spot. Um, in uh, one truck area up the block, and this job came over, you know, shots fired, you know, uh, you know, and the, the guy I was with, this guy Billy, uh, we're looking at each other and we're like, holy mackerel! And I'm not, a, I, I don't know the Bronx that well, <laughs> so but I know, I know kind of where it is. There's no GPS at that time, no cell phone, no anything. So, so we we we're in the truck, we shoot down to. Um, um, the FDR drive and we just start going north and we're, we're driving we're trying to get there as fast as we can and you know it says you know uptown the Bronx this that so so I'm just like keep on going keep on going keep we're going to go north and uh, just about before we I think we were we were not far from the Bronx maybe a few miles out a radio car went got in front of us and I and I said they can't be going anyplace else but there and we followed them right to the scene but uh yeah, that was, uh, in fact, that's where I met uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner John Miller when he was, uh, I believe, he was a journalist at that time. And uh, he was very uh, uh, close friends with Chief Johnston, who was the chief of the department, I believe, at that time. 
And uh, we, we were told we were in the cat cars when we were looking for Larry Davis. And we stayed in Yankee Stadium on and off. And we, you know, we stayed there overnight. And uh, we were told uh, from the from the higher ups that whatever John Miller wants, John Miller gets. <laughs> so we were like, okay. And now look where he is. Great you know, guy. Change is tough. Um, and going from patrol to emergency at first was not easy for me. Um, because the the gearing between patrol and emergency is completely different. Um, I, I went after after STS. Um, I went to work, and uh, I, I had I was in, involved with great guys in in one truck. Uh, Eddie Jergens and Mark DeMarco were my were my training guys, and I I worked with Bobby's Bobby Zabori and Kenny Winkler, and uh, Bobby Kennevin and Sergeant Adrat and O'Connor and Nagelberg, and I was just surrounded, you know, by those guys. Um, but it, at first, it was a tough fit for me because um, I was having a problem slowing down from the patrol aspect, where emergency services is extremely, um, they're not slow, um, but they're deliberate in their actions. And coming from patrol where you're just constantly doing doing something to be an emergency to um to take a step back in a situation was very tough for me to do and it, it took me a, a while for me to learn um what why why they are as deliberate as they were um you know it it that <laughs> uh, eddie eddie and uh eddie and and marco man they, they had the patience of a saint because i'm sure i drove them crazy <laughs> uh, but you know it so at first it, it it wasn't it wasn't an easy fit for me to 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 take that uh you know to to slow that patrol to get rid of the, to not get rid of the patrol aspect but just to just to put it aside and because if if you if you're being frantically screamed for over the radio which happens to emergency all the time uh, by patrol guys because cops are in shootings or cops are shot um, when you get there uh, as an emergency service cop now you know, you know patrol pa patrol has the um, the unfortunate uh, part of their job is they don't know what they're getting they're going to a noise complaint and when they get there, it's actually a domestic and the guy's armed and now it turns into a shooting. So where with emergency, you kind of knew what you were getting because it had already started by the time you were being called to it. The, the, does that make does that make sense to you? Yeah, the job is the job is pretty clear for the most part. You know, if it's a 1013, listen, you, everybody you got to go. As patrol right. doesn't know it's going to be a 1013 style call going in. It's right. It's, so the thing with emergency was when you get there, you cannot lose your head with everybody else. You, you need to stay focused on what you're doing and you need to get your equipment. No matter what's going on, you need to take control of the scene. You cannot get caught up in the mayhem of, of what's going on. Who's running around screaming into the radio stuff. It's your job to figure out what's going on. Grab one person, get a story. You know, it, it, you you couldn't you couldn't get caught up in, in the, the excitement because you had a job to do. It, it was your job in emergency service to start calming everything down. And um, I, fin I, I finally got that. It took me a little while to get that. Um, and I finally got it. And I, I, I thank the senior guys in, in the unit for for finally getting me to to see the way of, uh, of the emergency service unit. And uh you know, it, it didn't stop with it with Eddie Jergens and Mark DeMarco, you know, uh, guys in six truck, Warren Gunch and um, and uh, Bobby Godella and Steve Petrullo and, and uh, you know, Dan Guiney and, she, and Mike Keenan and, and Oliver. And, you know, again, you know, surrounded by guys that um, I've never seen such calm in the face of and it keeps and it keeps you calm. You know, but when your partner is calm, it keeps you calm, you know. Um, so it, it they, they were they were ex, 
I, I can't say enough about them. I really can't. I, I know other guys in emergency know exactly what I'm talking about. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's you, you're, on, you're only as good as your equipment. And if you get caught up, chances are you're going to forget some of your equipment and you're not you're going to be useless. Uh, so, you know, just slow down was their was their thing. Slow down and be deliberate um, in what you're doing. Uh, don't don't just rush into it. And actually, when I looked at it, when I started looking at it, what looked like was slow to me at first was not very slow at all. They were extremely fast in, in their in their actions. Um, but at first, it, it's, it, it, it was tough for me to get to get that through my head um, on, on the reaction, the reaction that emergency service guys had. Uh, poor Bobby Savori, when I was on patrol uh, and I was waiting to get picked up for emergency, that, that poor guy, every time he got called down into the fifth, I'd see him. It, I'm sure he said, oh, here he comes again, because every time I saw him, I was asking him, hey, are they picking anybody up? You know, and, and I'd bend his ear. Um, and I, I felt so bad. I felt so bad for him every time, every time he showed up down there. But um, that, that was, a, that is by far um, a great unit. Uh, I, I, I did things in that unit that I, I never thought I would ever get involved in. Um, you know, it's uh, unfortunate things uh, at times, um, but for, for the most part, a uh, very gratifying uh, 10 years in the job. So that said, I mean, uh, you mentioned, of course, going up to the bridges and bringing down people who are suicidal. It's a big part of what the emergency service unit does. I believe five truck the other day had a rescue on the Verrazano, if I recall correctly, where they talk somebody down. Um, but I, all the guys in ESU and gals as well are trained as what's called emergency psychological technicians. Now, I find that interesting because I've heard a few of them when I've interviewed them allude to that. Now, for the listeners that may not understand, I mean, we've heard of emergency medical technician, of course, but emergency psychological technician. What exactly does that entail? Well, if you have a person that uh, is a little bit on the, uh, the they were either depressed or they're, they're psychologically uh, off balance, we would try to talk them into coming in with us. If not, we had all kinds of non-lethal ways to get them to come in and of course we had nets we had uh, all kinds of stuff that we could uh, uh, use and at that time we started to use the uh, airbag and stuff like that if they were talking about jumping from the uh, whatever building that we're in but most of the time it was you, you talked them out of what they wanted to try to do and i think that that was so such, such an important thing that if you didn't jump to conclusions that you could talk to these people and understand that they have a problem they're asking for help and of course if we could help them they would probably say okay as long as somebody's going to help me i'm more than happy to come in and that's basically what we did whether it was on the bridge or in a building or whatever but it, it usually was because somebody wasn't listening or they just ran out of people that was willing to listen to them and we came and we tried to help them as much as we could. Um, when Oklahoma City happened, I remember seeing that on the news. Again, I have been taking my daughter to swim lessons, came home, went to bed, phone rang about 10 o'clock saying we'd be we're being deployed. And you go, so I looked at my wife, she says, go. So I grabbed my gear, went to Floyd Bennett Field. We started loading up our cash. This was the first um, real deployment as, as a New York task force, New York task force one. So we loaded up our gear, we got on the ground, I'm gonna say two, three o'clock in the afternoon. First thing we did was find a location that we could uh, work out of near the site. We were cleaning out, I think it was like a church or a school, a lot of broken glass. And then they came and they said, no, we have a spot back, there's a stadium, an arena, we're gonna use the arena. We went back, we got our gear, we formed up teams, we started working that evening. We had the 7 p.m. shift to 7 a.m. shift. We were very close to the team from uh, Virginia Beach. I think the other teams that were on site were from California. So you had two teams working 7 at night to 7 in the morning, and the two teams working 7 in the morning to 7 at night. We worked closely with uh, local fire department, Oklahoma City, firefighters from Tulsa. Um, one of the things that really always stuck out was the 
how friendly people were. I remember when we were cleaning out that, that, that church, the car pulled up and, you know, they had, you know, pans full of chicken and, and, and Gatorade. And, you know, us being from New York, we're always a little bit suspect when somebody was offering you food or somebody was offering you something for free. Um, I can tell you after 93, you know, some of the stores around the World Trade Center actually raised their prices. Um, and now you're out here and, and, you know, you're in Oklahoma City first time, you know, you don't know a lot about Oklahoma City. You know, I refer to it as the buckle in the belt, you know, the buckle in the Bible belt. But the, the, the genuine, um, the generosity that these people were showing was, was incredible, right? And we didn't ask for any of that. We were treated, we were treated very well. And the Muir building was a location in, that everybody had something to do with. Either you had some type of business in there, you worked in there. You know, it was a very central um, location for a lot of folks in Oklahoma City. So it really hit them hard, um, really did. So I, 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 when, I, when I left there, you know, I still feel um, a connection with Oklahoma City. We did a training exercise here for the company I work for now, Ports America our safety training exercise. And we actually hosted in Oklahoma City and we did a road trip uh, to the memorial. We went to the museum, went to the memorial. And to be honest with you, some people in the group couldn't understand why we were in Oklahoma City until we got there. The memorial is wonderful. Um, I know they work closely with the 9-11 memorial. Um, it's, it's something that everybody should see if they're, if they're out in that part of the country. But that the people out there, um, they really were a great bunch. Actually, a good start. I'll I I tell you uh, how this that whole, whole incident transpired. So when when I was on patrol, right, um, you called the issue for a multiple of things, right? You would call them for not just EDPs, barricaded holding hostages. You you would call them from a lot of rescue work. They, there was a large portion of rescue that was done by the issue unit, right? So auto extrications, we used to call them pin jobs, right? Um, uh, you know, any, any waterborne type of rescues, right? If a person's in the Hudson River or the, or the, or the East River, right? Or a, a boat accident, right? You were involved in waterborne, right? I've been on several jobs where people that were hit by struck by trains or they fell onto the tracks, right? And they were struck by a train. So when I seen this and I seen all that they do, I knew right away in my heart of hearts, that was for me. That's the direction I want to go in. Okay. So let me tell you how I got this. This is an interesting story. All right. And it tells you about how you're journeying in life that you really, I always say that your life is cut out, right? You can deviate a little bit to the left and you can deviate a little bit to the right. But I think a, a good portion of life, I think, it, it, is, is pretty much set when you're born. And here's how I'll tell you the reason why. So ESU is, is, is definitely an elite unit, all right? It was probably the most elite unit in the New York City Police Department. And they have, if not hundreds, several details. And you can go into narcotics. You can go into, you can go into so many different things you can go into, you know? But I chose the issue. Now, the question is, how do I get to issue, right? ESU was a unit that you needed to know the right people or you needed to do something spectacular on this job, all right, to be noticed, unless you knew somebody, right? If you had a, a parent that was an ESU, right, or if you had somebody that, you know, a very close friend of the family, they would actually speak to a couple of people and then it would ripple down and hopefully you would get in. That's how most people get in, okay? But there are people that, you know, regular Joes, I guess, like myself that, you know, you, you got to earn it somehow. And then you meet, you make your connections. Right. So what happened to me is that, um, a couple of years later, I would say in the early nineties, right. There was uh, we were on patrol, my partner and I, and it was on a late tour. Right. And we were driving down, driving down the late tour patrolling our sector. Right. And we seen this car. It was like rocking up and down. So the first thing I'm thinking of is that they're boosting the car. They're trying to steal the car, right? So, of course, my partner and I, we park a little bit further back. And as we're, we're approaching the vehicle, it was actually this gentleman, I want to say gentleman, but this male was raping this female in the car, right? He was holding her down by her throat, 
right? And he was raping her. So, of course, we're banging on the window, open the door. This guy wouldn't stop for nothing, right? So we wanted to break in the window and we actually dragged them out through the car window, right? We made an arrest. We lock him up, right? And I went to trial on that. And he did about, you know, I think he did like seven years for that, right? So uh, very good at rep. Now, there was a rash of rapes going on, right, at that time, right, in the confines of this precinct, right? That was one, I say, we got lucky, right? How many people do you know that that actually, that you could say on patrol that actually witnessed a rape in progress? Usually that's handed over to the detectives after the fact, and they investigate it, right? So that was a big arrest. And then we had this captain in my precinct. His name was Joe Lisi. Joe Lisi was, he retired, he's an actor. Mm -hmm. Joe Lisi's a good man, right? And he calls us in the office and he says, oh, great job, me and my partner, blah, blah, blah. You know, I said, okay, great. thank you, thank you, Cap, you know, and this and that. And we walk out. About a week later, there was a serial radius in the precinct. Right? And he comes down to turn out the troops, we used to call it, right? He used to do the roll call. Used normally a sergeant would do it, but he came down, the captain, and he said, he's turning out the troops. The captain wants to speak to everyone at the roll call. So what happened was he turned around and he says, listen, he goes, there's a serial rapist in this precinct. We have a photo of him and we want you to be, you know, uh, uh, vigilant. All right. Uh, of, of your sector and, 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 and uh, patrol your sector and see if you can get this guy. If you get this guy, you come see us, say me and any place you want to go is yours. All right. So I'm saying to myself, gee, wow. I said, it's, that's a pretty nice. You can go any place you want to go. All right. So, I said, yeah, they're passing the, the photo around, right? The photo comes to me. I look at it. And I got to tell you, I really don't forget a face, Michael. All right. It's one thing I have. I have like a, for some reason I just, I, if I met you 30 years ago, I would not forget your face. Right. I don't know why. Just it, it is what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. So I look at the photo. I turned to my partner and I said, hey, I locked this guy up three months ago for a misdemeanor offense. I know where he is. I know where he frequents. He goes, let me see that. She goes, I said, stay here. I'm running up to my locker. In my locker, when you make an arrest, you have like the pedigrees, you keep a copy of everything. Mm -hmm. So, and on top of the, the online booking sheet is a photo. And they, we stapled it onto, you know, all the online booking sheets. And I keep a box. So if ever I go to court, I can take my packet with me and I can, you know, I can refresh my memory of what had happened with the incident. I go up to my locker right away and I'm looking through this box. And sure enough, here he is. I lock him up. I locked him up like a, a couple of months prior. So I run downstairs and I see my partner. My partner at the time was this, uh, a gentleman named Joe Kasparri. Good, good cop, really good cop. And I said, Joe, I said, I, I know this guy is. This guy, this guy is a homeless guy. He sleeps in a refrigerator box, right? Underneath the FDR drive. I know where he is. So he goes, all right. He goes, I said, we got to get this guy, right? So we you know, and we're like, now we're at the point we're joking around. We're getting giggly because we're thinking, hey, this is our ticket out of here, right? you know, from patrol. Now we're moving on to bigger and better things if we can get this guy. So we go, um, we go, uh, we, we go on patrol. It was a four to 12 tour. And we go to a place where I knew he frequent. He was not there. Right. So I tried for a couple of days. Sure enough, like on the third, second or third night, we go there and there he is inside the, the refrigerator box. It wasn't like we even had to do much. We just, we knew where we, he frequent and we knew where to get him. Right. Wind up being, we get him. Right. We bring him in. Now, this is not an in progress. So it ain't my arrest. What happens is that there are so many multiple cases open with the sex crime squad. Right. That you got to turn the arrest over. All right. But you get credit for it because you grab the person. So it's just one of those things. And it's like it's like a homicide. If you don't witness homicide. A homicide get, uh, gets turned over to, to, to the detectives and they do the investigation. Right. I mean, you're instrumental in helping provide any information you can. But the overarching goal is you work as a team, regardless of who you are, to, to, to take a bad guy off the street. So we bring this, we bring this guy in and we call up the sex crime squads. We, you know, now, of course, that's the guy. All right. And he gets, they do a, a you know, a, a photo array and he gets picked out of a photo array. Then they're doing lineups, right? The detectives. And this is the guy, right? And they're happy. So this captain's happy. You know why? Because anytime you have a patent in your precinct, the borough commander, right, which is the chief, right, he gets down on, on the precinct commanders, right, to say, hey, listen, what's going on? You, you know, you got to do this. You got to clean up. And he gets pressure. 
So when they get pressure, right, they want to they want to make sure they get this guy. So what do you got to do? You got to you got to incentive incentivize a, a, a law enforcement to do extra, right, to make him look good. So if he looks good, then guess what? Then the chief looks good, and then it works all it ripples all the way up to headquarters, right? So we get this guy in, under arrest, the whole in process in the whole nine yards, and the detectives take up take him from there. Now we get called up to the captain's office, right? I never forget this. And we go upstairs and he says, guys did a great job. Sit down. And he's going back and forth. And he's carrying, he's in a real giddy mood, Joe Lisi, right? So he goes, all right, guys, where do you want to go? Narcotics? You want to go here? You want to go here? No. I want to go to ESU. I, 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 ESU? I said, wait, wait, Cap. You said any place that I want to go, I want to go to ESU. Right. And he said, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can get you. I said, so I get it. You break your promise. Right. So I said, we walked out. We didn't say anything. We walked out. He gets now he gets mad. He gets, he gets mad because we walked out showing that, hey, you said something and, you, and you're reneging on what you said. Right. So sure enough, he calls us up the next day. Come up here, you two. Right. I said, OK. So we go upstairs. He goes, what's up? He goes, all right, you're going to issue. I said, so how'd you pull that one off? He goes. You know, John Timoney, I said, I said, yeah, John Timoney was first deputy commissioner. Yeah. He goes, when I started out, he was my radio car partner. I said, really? He goes, I called John up. He goes, you guys are going to issue. I said, really? He goes, in the next class, of course. So I said, when they call, you're in the next class. So, um, you know, I guess three, three months passed and down the teletype, it came that you were going into the next issue class. Right. But prior to that, now, let me tell you this now. So prior to that, this is a good story also. Prior please, to yes, that, sure. excuse me? That's it, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So prior to that, even though you're in, you still got to go for interviews, right? So when I go for an interview, now, mind you, all right, there's a little thing in the police department, right? And it's nothing to do with, you know, it's just the way it is, right? The Irish, right, worked in ESU. The Italians worked in the detective squad. OK, that's the way it was. Not everybody. I mean, ESU had some Italians and, and detective squad, you know, but predominantly that was the gist. Right. So I go for this interview and I see this Irish sergeant. I won't mention his name. He's long retired. And he says to me, he goes, uh, I hear you did a lot of good things. And he's great. He goes, I hear a lot of good things about you. He goes, you guys, I hear, you know, are really great cops in the priest. Blah, blah, blah. He goes, I would love to have you. He goes, but I got to say one thing take a look around the room over here. And he goes, what do you notice? And I'm looking around. I'm young, right? I'm looking around. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything, right? He goes, take a little closer look at the nameplates. So I'm looking around and now it hits me. He goes, you came to the wrong squad. You got to go to the detective squad. And I said, I don't want to go to the detective squad. <laughs> I want to come to your issue, right? So Lo, lo and behold, they did clear up, and three months later, we were in the issue. It was a funny story, but it has, it, you know, it's this cultures, right? But it was not, it was not done in a malicious way. You know, back in those things, it was acceptable, right? It was just, it was, it was those things that we didn't look and say, oh, it's racism. You didn't do that. It, it, it was just different cultures, and you accepted, and you got along with people, and you worked things out. It was different than this day and age. Everything is racist. It's not, we're not racist. Nobody's racist, you know? But there are a lot of great people out there. But that's the way probably it would have been perceived at this day and age. But back then it was like, no, no, I want to go here. And eventually I got there. Right. And then 15, 16 years later, I seen that same sergeant and I said to him, he goes, hey, kid. So he used to call me kid. Right. And I'm older now. Right. He goes, did you make it to the squad? I said, yeah, I made it to the squad. I said, I made it to ESU because ESU was called the emergency, ESS, really. Right. Emergency <laughs> Service Squad. So I said, I made it to the squad, the emergency squad. And that's how I got there. And that's the story. If you're not learning from your mistakes and your experiences, then you're not learning at all. And, uh, and those are opportunities lost. And I'm, I'm very big on that. If we're not learning from it, because uh, everybody screws up sometime, and that's fine. But if as long as you correct those mistakes along the road, you're going to be a more experienced ESU cop at the end of it and uh, be better off, make better decisions. And to piggyback off of that, you know, the next e-cops are coming through that are joining the unit and are newbies. They'll learn from that, too. Um, and Absolutely. it's going to help them, you know, as the generations pass, not only learn from themselves, pass it off to the next generation, so on and so forth. 
-hmm. So that brings us to the morning of September 11th, 2001. You're a relatively new e cop at the time. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned in the promo, when I was uh, getting ready to, to, to uh, record this interview with you, I don't think any course, I don't think any test could have prepared any cop, even the most experienced one for that mm -hmm. morning. So you were on election duty because this was the morning of the mayoral primary. So take yes. it from there. Well, it was the it is the only year and the only time ever in NYPD history where the Special Operations Division was not exempt from sitting at election duty. So the NYPD and their and their great minds came together and said, let's take highly skilled and highly trained the issue officers, pilots, harbor captains, everybody from special operations are not exempt, and we'll put them sitting at election duty on polls so that we don't have to touch patrol officers who have to answer 911 calls and so on. So there I was sitting at a, at a school in the 6-2 precinct and we saw the first plane hit. Um, I'm sorry, I heard the first plane hit on the radio and then somebody wheeled in a TV. And 20 minutes later, I believe the second plane hit or something like that. And we knew something, we were under attack. And I was studying for the sergeant's exam. I had all my books with me. So I called the 6-2 precinct desk and I told the sergeant, I said, they're calling for all ESU personnel to respond to the trace. And I said, I have to leave. And he said, you can't leave. This is an election. This is election duty. You can't just walk away from the poll, which is a very big no-no. You're not supposed to walk away. And I told him, I said, oh yeah, well watch this. So I hung up the phone and I got my books together and I'm starting to get my, all my things together to run out. And a 6-2 precinct RMP pulls up in front. And I said, here it comes. This is going to be bad. And I figured there was going to be some kind of fight or something. The sergeant was going to yell at me. And he jumped out of the, a sergeant jumped out of the car and he says, I got you, kid. Go ahead, go. And he covered for me so that I can leave. I was like, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I went to the I went to truck six, my command. And I, since I was in patrol uniform, when you're on election duty, you have to sit on patrol with patrol uniform on. I put on my ESU uniform on so I could be recognized when I get there. So myself and three other officers jumped in a suburban and flew to the trade center. And we got there before the buildings collapsed. And we went to Weston Vesey and um, we would we put on all our rescue gear. This is the biggest rescue we can think of. You know, let's go up there and see who we can rescue. So we grabbed tools and we grabbed rope gear. I have my rope gear on and so on. And uh, 50 yards away is the, uh, the North Tower. So we start walking towards it. Me and a bunch, there had to be about 15 of us. And uh, halfway there, Sergeant Sullivan, Tom Sullivan from Truck 6 calls us back and he says, uh, Get out of your rescue gear, put on your tactical gear. We're getting reports of shots fired that uh, terrorists are shooting people as they're running out of the building. So we thought that was a little crazy, but then we looked at each other and said, you know what? I did hear some popping noises. Maybe, maybe that is shots fired. Let's, let's get our stuff on and get over there. Although we thought it was a crazy decision, crazy, because this is like a big rescue. And he's telling us to put on helmets, vests, and grab machine guns. Reluctantly, we did it. It took only about five minutes. But um, that five minutes, we started walking back towards the building with our guns and everything. And that's when we looked up and we heard a, a roar. It sounded like a freight train on a track was coming straight down at us. It looked like a piece of the building was falling off, you know, because we only glimpsed at it and we started running. So we ran back to the big truck and I ran behind the big truck. There was no room to get in it. <laughs> there was some people back there already. And I saw this 13th precinct cop running around in circles like he had no he didn't know where to go. On the, at that time, West and Bessie, it was a big parking lot. There was nothing there. So I grabbed him and I yanked him up against the truck with me. And uh, then all of a sudden it just went pitch dark, just completely pitch dark. And by the way, we found out those shots fired later on were police officers yeah, shooting out windows. the windows. So people and a great job they did at that because more people were able to flood out of there and run. So as it turned pitch dark, I mean, after two or three minutes of being in pitch dark, I thought I was dead. I mean, it was dead silence. I have my hand on the truck. I, I try to feel out with my other hand. I can't feel anything. So I move away from the truck. I see if I could feel something. And I'm, I'm walking through the street completely blind. There's can't see anything. And uh, I go, oh, my God, I can't find anything. I don't even hear people. So I go back to go field for the truck. I said, let me stay by the truck. And I couldn't find the truck. I, I completely lost it. So I'm running out of air and I'm like, oh my God, I'm just you're breathing in black stuff. Just, kind, you know, like, like normal oxygen, but it's not. I'm running out of air. I'm getting lightheaded and I take my heavy vest and I throw it over my face, find a pocket of air. 
And I use that up quickly. And now I'm, I go down to my knees, I'm running out of air and uh, it's getting a little lighter out. Like it's turning white. You can't see anything, but it's white now. And as I'm about to fall onto the floor, I see an old partner of mine just come out of the smoke, almost like God put him there, you know, and he comes out with a Scott mask and he puts it right on my face. And let me tell you something, that was the best air I've ever breathed in my entire life. It was fantastic that he found me and he put the mask on my face. So EMS comes running over and they're treating me. But as all this is happening, there's this photographer on the corner. He's taking pictures of us, me getting treated. And I could see him through the smoke. He's taking pictures and taking pictures. And we're yelling at him to get out of there because the other building might fall. So we evacuate after EMS treated me. I, we evacuated a half a block towards the water, North End Avenue and Vesey. And the other building collapsed, uh, Tower 2 collapsed. And this gentleman, this photographer was killed. Bill Baker. And two months later, they found his body. And on his body was the camera and the pictures of us. And it was in Newsweek magazine. And uh, so, and then I was there for about 500 hours afterwards, you know, uh, just uh, searching and doing the best we could to find anybody. So that first time training on the bridge and going up it, Tell me about what your heart was doing, because I imagine that had to be something. Uh, you know what? It was more of a thrill. I think uh, I remember someone saying, hey, someone better bring a camera because nobody's going to believe this. And uh, at that time, I, I wasn't married. So I remember showing the picture to my family, you know, showing like, hey, listen, they couldn't believe what I was doing. Uh, you know, from a police officer standpoint, to be doing this was you know, I always felt every day at work wasn't work. I enjoyed, you know, uh, it was just some place I wanted to be. So to me, this was just another adventure, you know. Um, I, while being a few jobs on the Brooklyn Bridge, I never was a person that actually had to put my hands on anybody. It usually, uh, uh, one truck, the, the Manhattan truck would get, often beat us to the job from a truck, which was Brooklyn North, which came out of the 9-0. So whoever could get to the to the person first was often a race. Um, I can remember uh, one of the a jumper job we had on the George Washington Bridge, and there was a fellow dressed up in a tuxedo up there, and it was a absolutely gorgeous day. You could see from here like to Florida, it was unbelievable. But they had traffic backed up in both directions, as far as the eye could see, and I. I we couldn't get near the guy. Basically, we kind of waited him out. Eventually, he got kind of tired and hungry, and then we were able to get him. But for those four hours being up there, I, you know, we were more, you know, we we're more like enjoying the sights and saying, oh, my God, I'm glad I'm not stuck in traffic than, uh, than this poor guy. Uh, but uh, it was a successful end to the day, but not if you were on, not if you were in traffic. So. For, for rescue, I, I have to say, was a, a building fire. We just happened to be rolling down and um, some folks came uh, frantically waving us down that a building around the corner had just caught fire. And as we turn, we see smoke coming out of all the windows. Uh, so I jump out of the truck. We get on the radio. We call the fire department. And uh, I jumped up on top of the truck to get onto the fire escape. And I managed to get up to about the fourth floor. And I can hear children screaming, children. Uh, so I broke a couple of windows, got in, uh, grabbed a couple of kids, carried them down. Went back up, got a couple more, carried them down. And um, to see their, you know, the way the kids were clutching my jacket as I was carrying down the fire escape is something I'll never forget. But um, to, to see their faces, to see the, the precinct guys' faces, uh, the, the parents who unbelievably left their kids behind, I, I still haven't figured that one out. Um, it, it was, yeah, that, that, that showed me. It, it meant a lot to, I, I was in the unit just a, a month or so, but um, that that showed me uh, that this this is what we do, and this is why I'm here. That service, and you've heard it, service is our middle name, is one of the old limericks of ESU, because wow. it's not, yeah. yeah, it's not just those jobs where you're serving a warrant on a really violent criminal that the detective squad has told you, yeah, this guy's nuts, and yeah. we, we can't get him alone. It's, it's not just the pin jobs. I mean, even something as simple as somebody's locked out of a car. Somebody's ring fell down a drain. A cop's radio fell down a drain. You know, uh, a kid got his head stuck in the fence because he was goofing around. Yeah. Little things like that, ESU handles. Somebody's ring is stuck on their finger, and the finger's swelling up to the point where it's it's going to go bad. Yeah. You got, you got a, a little tool on the truck that can, you know, it's a ring cutter. You can cut Yeah, it's that, like so. it, it slips under the ring, and you kind of 
twisted and it it like saws off the ring, <laughs> like a little saw. And, right. Um, but it they use it manually. So, yeah. I remember when I interviewed John Miller. He he when he saw that because he was riding along with in truck one with Kevin Barry, who later went to the Bomb Squad and Bobby Benz. And uh, he was saying after that was done, he asked Kevin Barry, "What was that? A hacksaw for midgets?" <laughs> 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 you know, but it's 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 the testament to the range that ESU has. So everything is on that truck, and it's not just the heavy rescue truck; it's the Adam car, it's the boy car. Learning that, especially you know, if you had to be a chauffeur, um, how pivotal was that for you? Because obviously, listen, even if you're not necessarily going in and utilizing these tools yourself, which is the first aspect of it, let's say you're the chauffeur one night and the guys or the gals are running out to you and they're saying, Hey, Maddie, can you get me this? You have to yeah. know where it is. So, for you, take me through that process of learning what was on these trucks and learning how to use the tools. That was something that I really love to, to do if when I was a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. Um the things that you had I don't know if they probably told you before this, but you had to before you became a chauffeur, you had to know that truck. You had to know what tools were on it, that the tools were working, that um because that's exactly how things happen very quickly. You can't be messing around and you know you go to cut somebody out of the um a car and you don't and you, you don't have enough fuel in the in the hearse tool i mean these are, are things that are really important not just to the police department but to um you know the public at large you really have to know where these things are because quite often I, I mean, I've had this happen to me, and and you could probably ask other e cops, and they tell you the same thing. Yeah. EMS and us, we go to a a pin job. The people in there are really they're jammed up, you know, and I, they'll look at you and they'll go like, "Can you get this guy out, or should we just call it right here?" You know, and we would look at them and we would be like, "No, no, we'll get him out." And it just gave you that much more drive to really make sure we never weren't able to get someone out of a vehicle or uh, a bad situation. But you must um, know that truck. Um, you're responsible for that truck. That truck is responsible for aiding for the lives of the the police officers, the uh, citizenry, and, you know, it really is a lot of responsibility if you're going to do it and you try to do it right. Absolutely. Yeah, I um, I really, at first I didn't want to go to three truck. I wanted to stay down in Brooklyn in the right. in seven truck because that's where I really cut my teeth in the seven five. So I knew the streets. I wanted to stay in seven. Uh, I got my marching orders, go to three truck. They need the help. A lot of us went up there from the specialized training school uh, class that I graduated with. We, and then we went to three truck. Uh, in retrospect, the Bronx was an awesome place to work in. Uh, they had as much work as anybody. We had a lot of uh, pin jobs, you know, people getting stuck in autos because we had all the major um, highways going through. You know, the, we had the Clearview, the Cross Bronx. We had 95. Uh, we had them all right there. So we specialized in doing that. It was good because you can get from one place to another in the Bronx relatively quick. Right. Uh, say if you were in Brooklyn or Queens, it'd be a hot job, you know, a perp job or some rescue that you wanted to make. And it took you a long time to get there just because of the sheer size of the boroughs. And a lot of times you get there, either the job was already over, um, the fire department had completed or another truck. But right. in the Bronx, it was pretty tight because we can get there pretty quickly. And mitigate whatever was uh, coming. There's a job that I know Mike was credited for, Sergeant Curtin. I'm referring to, of course. Yep. And it was a building collapse. I think it might have been in 1999. And Figiano was there too. Were you on that one? Yeah, that was. I think it was Lexington Avenue. All right, tell me about that job. Uh, they were doing construction on a on a building. I, I want to say it was a two three, maybe the two five, um, over that over that neighborhood. And I was in the truck with 
Mike, Sergeant Curtin, and the Adam car was out. Vidge was in the Adam car with Pete Linarillo mm -hmm. from Six Truck. He flew up for the day. And uh, some sort of building collapse came over. I remember the Adam car call, call, calling to say, hey, start the truck. And we got over there. And we had gotten there. And there was a worker that was trapped under some rubble, um, some big wooden beams. There weren't steel beams in this building. They were old wood timbers and uh, a lot of bricks. So he was covered from like his, his abdomen down on like kind of a uh, – a slant going into the basement. So we went into there and, you know, we, we got equipment that we needed. And the three of us, actually the four of us actually were all in there at one point. Um, but Mike had called me in with certain equipment as a chauffeur. And they had removed the guy and packaged him and, and brought him out safely. Um, you know, I think he had a broken pelvis, if I recall correctly, definitely a, a broken leg. I know he's in a lot of pain, but, you know, it took a little while. And I think we were accompanied by the fire department, probably most likely, but I know it was, it was, the emergency guys the package one them. happy story down there though is um in in uh february in the middle of february just around this time we had um at, there was a single beam in the southeast quadrant of the pit standing over there and all of a sudden i see like these two Port Authority cops going like doo, 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 in this scissor jack basket, and they're like they ra raising the basket up and everything like that. And they whip out a stencil and they start spray painting P A P D thirty seven. So I'm like I'm like I'm like yo, let's go, yo. you know, whistling up to the guys and they lower the basket down and everything like that. So I'm like. I want to go up there with you guys. So they're like, yeah, yeah, come on in. So I jump in the basket. Back up we go. They finish painting theirs. So they're like, you know, and the guys down down in the thing are like, what are you going to do? What are you going to put on there? Like, you know, somebody yells out, ESU, ESU 14. I'm like, I knew that was not going to happen. I was like, there was 23 of us lost. So I start free, free hand, N, Y, P, D, and the D, I just missed the edge of the beam for the D, but I get it in there and I kind of clean it up just enough. And then I do the, the 20, the, the two, and, I'm, and I stop for a second and I'm like, the three, I'm going to do the truck three flat symbol and I spray paint the, the three of the 20 for the three that eventually we found out we had lost three from three truck we thought it was more you know we we had not known who you know who else so on and so forth was you know so as far as that we just knew that we had lost the 23 that day and I was like I'm doing that that was you that so, put that on there I spray painted the NYPD 23 up on it. I have been to the museum. I went with my family back in 2016, and I saw that beam. It has FDNY 343 on it. Yeah. And uh, that was I know you did that. Post, that. That made up made up for like everything that bad in my you know bad that I've experienced. I, that was one of my proudest moments because I know. I know even though we lost 14 superstar guys, but no, we lost 23 talented police officers, detectives, sergeants. Like, and I'm not, I was ne never ever going to be a thought in my mind to just put us over them because. It was the job, you know, for me, it was the job representing what, what we all did down there. Uh, but you, you had three. So, uh, you know, I asked this question completely respectfully, not, you know, with any disrespect at all. Did you have a hook that allowed you to get in earlier? Were you a really active cop with a good rep? Is that what helped you? I had a recommendation uh, by an inspector uh, who was uh, who knew me from, from my neighborhood and, and childhood and everything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you didn't have the... Uh, the testing criteria and the uh, selection process criteria that you have today. In fact, it, it's kind of funny because I would 
eventually become a lieutenant in emergency service and be the guy to help uh, install these new, more stringent uh, selection criteria and training processes. So it's funny because when I came up, there was no such thing. There was no standard selection process. You went down to uh, ESU, and uh, which I did. I went down at the time. It was uh, in the back of the old 18th Precinct. That's where the emergency service base was. It's now the Midtown North Precinct. But at that time, on 54th Street, at that time, it was the 18th Precinct. I went in there, and I got interviewed by a Captain Bill Voss. And uh, he, uh, he was the guy who put me, you know, put me through the interview. And I had, of course, I had military background. I had, uh, I was working for the telephone company prior to the, uh, to, uh, to the, to being appointed in the PD. I had uh, experience working in the shipyard. I was a welder at the Bethlehem Steel Shipyards in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. So I brought skills uh, to the table, and that's what it was based on. Because remembering that. The emergency service unit was established originally in 19, well, 1925 was the pilot program, but the official establishment of emergency service was April 10th, 1930. Mm -hmm. But the idea of an emergency squad, if you will, was to put together people with skills so that in uh, extreme emergencies, we had a bunch of school skilled people that we could deal with. We had riggers, we had carpenters, we had plumbers, we had electricians. We had medical people, we had military people, we had weapons people. So you put all these people together and now you have a force of, of skills, which is still true today, except today it's more formalized. So that was how I got in. I, they, uh, you know, that interview got As me. Tom said at the end of that clip, you got to improvise because there's no two alike. So in a situation like that, you're there right before the fire department got there, actually. So you, but you were working hand in hand with them on that job, which I love because I know there's been a history, at least previously, it's not like this now, of emergency service and fire department button heads. But there, they came right in, and they backed you guys up, and this guy was able to get out alive. And what I loved especially is. He had a back injury. Now, we've heard this, and you don't have to be a, a, a medical expert to know. If somebody's got a back injury, it could be something spinal. And if, the, if it's their spine or their neck and you move them a certain way, you could kill them. So getting there and obviously working in such a confined space like that, take me through that job. Yeah, that that was uh, – hey, first of all, we did beat the fire department there. And that's unusual because we are quite a distance away from that. Flushing is where we turn out of it at 109 Precinct. That was all the way north up on the, uh, I mean, south on the Long Island Expressway. But we were responding to an EDP job. So it was a confirmed EDP right about not even a quarter of a mile away from where that accident happened. So it was like it was planned, if, you know, for lack of a better way to explain it. And we got there We got there really quick. Um, the guy was pinned in there really bad. Not not one of the worst I've seen, but he was, he was really trapped in there good. Um, what, again, you got to go back to your training. You gotta, when you assess the situation, you have to know what tools you need. Uh, you have to have your medical training also, because like you said, if you have a neck injury, you can hurt him worse or even kill him. But, you know, we, that was a squad that I worked with for many years at the time, squad, I think it was squad two. And we worked very well with each other. Um, we got the guy out. It took a little bit of time, but we got him out alive. He wasn't wasn't seriously hurt he just was really pinned in there good i mean he was trapped in, a, in an area where uh it was probably tight for a little baby if to move and like you said we worked hand in hand with the fire department they didn't get in the way they just uh, assisted us in whatever we needed and it was a, another good successful rescue in 1997 there was operation triple play and which brought down 12 major drug gangs so they were doing a lot of good busts at this time was that his main target, or was he more focused on guns around this time? What was the makeup of the 18 as the 20th century commenced in 2000? You know what? The 18 relies on all the intelligence to come from, whether it's narcotics or a precinct detective squad or a precinct snoo team or, or a warrant squad. So <clears throat> whatever particular entity that was requesting the apprehension team, we did not develop our own intelligence. We, did, we never developed our own warrants. So that was not something that we just got a job that came in. And we would go handle it, whether it was for drugs or guns or something else. So, hmm. you know, I think it all depended upon uh, the area of the city that you were working, what that precinct's major crime 
issue happened to be. If, if it was guns and it was an active anti-crime team or uh, an active precinct detective squad, they would develop that intelligence, get a CI, you know, apply for a search warrant, get it approved, and then we would go execute that warrant. I'll ask you, because around this time as well, I mean, think about it. There is the <coughs> details at Madison Square Garden, because even if the Rangers weren't doing too hot at this time, uh, the Knicks certainly were. They were in the playoffs. You have the Yankees as well, and you got and, and the Mets, because they were good at this time as well in their playoff games. Presidential visits. I think the U.N. also had its 55th anniversary in 2000. And I was reading that. I don't know if this was the 18th, but at least for the counter assault aspect, they would rely on some 18 guys. So for those kinds of big details, UN General Assembly, things of that nature. Um, would would the A team have a large role in it? Were you guys detailed strictly to that? And tell me about that if so. We would we would always for the UN or presidential visit, we would always get tasked with some type of uh, aspect of that visit, whether it was riding in a counter assault team vehicle for a presidential motorcade or another foreign head of state or a, a dignitary like the Pope. <clears throat> when they would come in, the apprehension team might get a piece of uh, a. a the protective detail for whoever was coming in. So Got that it. was, yeah, that was definitely a, uh, a big part of the apprehension team at that point. We, we had unmarked vehicles. We, we always had an unmarked van that we would use, jump in a motorcade. And <clears throat> so it, it was something that we did quite a bit of. And you guys were very well trained because notice these details go off without a hitch. And you're not yeah. only work, it's not just the NYPD, you have to manage federal agencies too and cross coordinate with them. And I, I am always amazed at how well you guys do it. It's such an organized mission. Well, it, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And that was something I was actually very fortunate to be involved in when I was an instructor at the specialized training school. We did a lot of joint training with the U.S. Secret Service, with the dip diplomatic uh, security service from the State Department, with other police departments. We would always work in conjunction with all those in different trainings throughout the year leading up to a big event like UNGA or a presidential visit. We, you know, uh, the emergency service unit spent a week down at Beltsville with the U.S. Secret Service uh, back in the mid 2000s. We spent a week working with their counter assault team and learning the ins and outs of how they operate. And they learned the ins and outs of how we operate. And we were able to go really put our heads together and come up with a with a, a very good working relationship. Not that we didn't have it before, but <clears throat> because of the closeness of the training that we did, it enabled us to really have uh, a much higher level of understanding of each other's uh, function in that particular uh, assignment. So it, 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 I think it went a long way uh, to making us you know, part of that uh, that teamwork that uh, that goes into putting those details. To the I can tell one of the funniest rescues, uh, and it's a me rescue. So all this time, I'm in emergency. You know, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. I wanted a picture of me of doing something, anything. I could care what it, whatever it was. And um, I was working with Joe Castro one day. Um, we were both in a truck, and a, a bridge call came. So Joe and I, we get into the truck. He's uh, he's the operator. I'm the recorder. We shoot down and we're the first ones on the bridge. We beat Hollywood there. We beat one truck there. I'm smiling because I can see the helicopters and I know it's this is me day. This is Ronnie day. I grab two belts. I throw a belt on and I head up the, the cables of the bridge, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge really fast. And I'm up the bridge and there's a guy there and he's speaking French and I don't speak French. So I start speaking Spanish, a little bit of Spanish, trying to get him to, to see if we can find some middle area. Right. And he's right. not really complying. And I'm looking, I'm saying, oh, man, this is going to make the paper. I'm a star today. So anyway, Randy Amy, one truck comes up behind me when Randy gets close by. I say, Randy, I'm going to put a belt on the guy. I don't think he's going to resist. I belt the guy up. I hold him. Randy and I walk him down. We load him on top of the Joe on top of the truck. Joe loads him into the truck, down through the truck on EMS and he's gone. And I'm just grinning like a chest air cat because I know I made the paper. I get in the truck and I run back to uh to uh quarters to see what's going on turn on the news and there it is there's a picture of joe loading him into the truck there's a picture of randy escorting him on the stretcher to the ambulance and no picture of me whatsoever <laughs> i giggled my head off <laughs> almost almost uh, another big uh bridge bridge job um i was I, I flew to six trucks i was working in six trucks for the day so there was somebody up on the verrazano and uh uh, I think it was Joe DeFresco 
Um, he and I, we went out there. There was a bunch of guys there, but he and I, we went out. We were both tied in, and we're talking to this guy, and he's doing most of the talking, and eventually we, we uh, restrained the guy. We put some cuffs on him, and um, there's a guy from Five Truck. I think his name was Sheehan. So anyway, he, uh, we, the three of us load him back on, and we get him on an ambulance. He goes about his business. A couple of months later, Joe gives me a call and says, Ronnie, check out this article in the paper. In the paper, Sheehan had a day dedicated to him for that rescue. And you <laughs> were there. The on the bridge, yeah. And uh, I was laughing because, you know, it didn't look like that big a job for me, but we missed our day in Staten Island. Well, there he, you go. Made, he made Mr. Staten Island. So there's a bunch, bunch of good calls out there. Um, I don't know which one is better than the other, but a lot of rescues. Oh, this one is significant to me. Um, there was a uh, scaffold that broke loose in the city. And this one is significant because uh, it was one of my opportunities to work with Tommy Langone. And um, uh, one truck was on, on the roof of the skyscraper. Um, they were lowering some guys down, but they needed the scaffold tie, tied off. So Tommy and I, we went to some floor. I don't remember what it was. We went through a window and we began to tie the uh, scaffold off. Tommy, the man, all he told me what not to tie. He would hand me a rope, tell me what not, what to fix it to. And he was doing all the work, doing all the work. We got the scaffold tied off. We looked like superstars. And the guys lowered down, um, strapped the guy in, and got him off the scaffold. Incredible job. Incredible job done by Tommy. Now, going back into emergency medical rescue, what's interesting about the train jobs, and that's that's not exactly the only thing you guys did. We'll get into the other things that unit did uh, as we go along here. But the train jobs... People don't realize how hard it is to lift the train. Now, granted, you're not Superman. You're, going, you're not going underneath. Okay, one, two, three, and lifting it up. You have to jack it up a little bit. But if you jack it too much, it can fall over, which creates even more problems than you have at the start. You, so, you, you know what, Mike, it, it's involved. It's probably tell you, it would take a little too long for your audience. But absolutely, if you jack it too much, if people notice the wheels have, there's an edge that sticks. That There's like a lip on the wheel. It keeps that wheel on the track bed. Obviously, if you lift it, if you lift it over that, chances are i can't slide out but on, you know what in most of my lifts you know if that train wheel ran over someone and the person was still alive you didn't need much to kind of slide that body part or the individual out of that situation so and, and if we showed you if i told you when i say we used to it wasn't a, a mechanical jack it was an airbag probably about an inch wide you know and uh that airbag once inflated would actually lift the train off the rail just enough so that we can remove either the body part or the whole body and i i would say half the jobs i responded to the people were still alive mm -hmm. so you know you had your, you know your people that were dead and then you had some that were alive and, and the ones that were alive you know what again it was it was satisfying to be able to get it get in there lift that train get them out and even though maybe they possibly losing a limb, at least you, you know, you were successful in getting them out of there alive. Yeah. So it, it was one of the most interesting parts of transit rescue because the, just the fact, just trying to get to that person was a task in itself. You're basically crawling under a train, maybe 18 inches on your belly trying to get to that individual and now you're trying to get all the equipment in there obviously you had help and stuff like that but the person that was getting into the, that was getting on the train to access that person I mean, you know it was uh you know many times my gun belt would get stuck on some of the train parts and stuff like that and and, and, you, and you kind of catch yourself almost panicking and then you calm yourself down and you're like okay listen you've trained for this you know what to do back out if you had to you will loosen your, your, your gun belt and you got out of that situation but uh it, it was definitely a challenging job when you had a person under a train. April 2nd, 1995. That is the day in which trans went and EMRU was rolled into ESU. That date means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Some look at it as a good day, some as a bad day, some as a mixture of both. The 2nd of April of 95, what does that date personally mean to you, John Bushing? The... People that I worked with in, in EMRU were fantastic. We were a very close knit uh, group, and you know we did good. But the opportunities that the city and emergency service presented to us, I would have never 
ever come anywhere close if we had stayed just the, the transit police. So as far as me personally, uh, the opportunities that I had in emergency service, just you were it, you know, like they had already absorbed housing and transit. So there was, there was no other issue, even a small unit like, like the both of us were, we were it. And anything that happened, you were going. And that was just what a great feeling. It was so exciting. And, and again, we stood on the shoulder of guys from my father's generation. Then we had guys standing on our shoulder. It's, it's, it's those traditions and, and that dedication and, and wanting to do the job that makes it work. But I can bet you today the ESU cops and the ESU bosses that are on patrol, many of them don't know me. I'm from a generation ago. Remember, I'm, out, I'm retired 19 years. Yeah. Many of these guys don't know me on a personal basis. But I can tell you right now, I can guarantee you, I know what their traditions are. I know that, they, I know that they're going to know the importance of never saying no to another cop always helping another cop. I know that I know the workload hasn't changed. You're still getting the gain entries, the lock-ins, the lockouts, uh, on top of the hostage and the barricade jobs, the rescue jobs, the pin jobs, the jumper jobs. So I I, I mean the unit keeps going forward. And I look at pictures that get posted online sometimes and I'm like, wow, that's an awesome piece of equipment. We could have really used that back in the day. But you know, that's the beautiful part about a, a small unit, a, a highly motivated group of individuals, male and female, who love being cops, who love doing the job, and want to be there to help other cops out. And, and I got to tell you, you know, these are tough times. These are tough times to be a cop now. Policing is not easy. Policing no. is difficult. But I remember when I first came on... Cops, when I got to the six, seven, saying, why'd your father let you take this job? This job's dead. It sucks. There's no sense being a cop. Well, I wanted to, be, I, I still wanted to be a cop. Just like today, there's still guys that want to be police. They want to be cops. And you know what? My generation had to adjust to the changes from the early 60s. We had to start doing things a certain way. And the generation that's there today, they're trained to use cameras. They have better training, better equipment. They have better, less than lethal equipment. So you know what? If they want to be the police, tune out all the white noise, all the nonsense going on around you. It's still, it's still a noble job. It's still a, it's still a great career. And I know right now, probably the chat room is lighting up with people saying this guy's psychotic that he's saying that, you know what? This too shall pass. We have good times and we have bad times in policing. Every 25 years, it gets bad. There's a corruption scandal or it gets bad. Well, guess what? This will pass. The NYPD will bounce back. I have the utmost faith in the training and 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 the traditions that the NYPD's instilled. Will so you know when I hear things say, "Ah, the unit stinks." It's not the way. It's not the way it was when you were there. No, maybe it's not the way it was when I was there. It's better than when I was there. You know why? It's got to be better because you got smarter people, better trained people with better equipment. So when a guy tells me, "Ah, it's not the same when when you were there," no, it's it's probably better than when I was there because. We had better equipment than my father's generation, and this generation has much better equipment and much better training than my generation. So I don't want to hear, you know, I, I get off my soapbox there, maybe that you get a word in. No, nah, that was great. That was great. I'm fired up. Now I want to go take the test. All right. And you kind of talked about it here, but if there's other ones, you can name them. Funniest call you ever responded to. <laughs> I meant to send you a picture, and I didn't. Uh... It's not too late. Labor Day of uh, 2004, maybe 2005, doing a 4 to 12, just come in, cup of coffee, equipment's on the, on the Adam car, I'm working with Greg Welch, jumper on the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, confirmed by division almost immediately, he's on the, he's on the Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn Tower, it's okay, start heading down, it was Labor Day, it was, uh, it was the Monday, and we get on the FDR drive as soon, you know, it's a, it was a flip of the coin. You know, if you didn't see cars from the elevated part, you know, when you got on the FDR, you gambled or if, when you went around the bend past the, uh, the power plant at 15th street and all of a sudden you get brake lights, you know, you, you knew you were committed now, at least down to Houston street. Uh, we wide open, we made it all the way down to just before the bridge and we hit traffic. 
now everybody's stopping because uh, they had bridge autos, the 5th Precinct on our side, the 8-4 on the other side. Depending on whether or not the cop was using common sense and knew that ESU was coming up the roadway, trying to talk to him on radio, you know, tell him to pull traffic, pull traffic. A truck had come the other way, counterflow, and they were on the bridge right. They're at they're at the actual, you know, at the base of the tower, the Brooklyn Tower. They reconfirmed the job. Now we're just bottled up, we're pickled. We make our way around the bend. We end we're ended up in an area where we could leave the leave the REP and uh Greg makes a comment. He says, I guess we're going to have to walk. I look at him. I'm like, that's a far walk. Get out of the truck, open the bin, grab our personal rope bags, grab the 200 foot rope bag. And with that now, here comes two motorcyclists, uh, like a nin ninja type bikes with uh, two guys got dreadlocks down to their rear ends. One guy's got a big spike on his helmet. And they're racing the engines, trying to zigzag through. So I see him. I'm like, you believe the nerve of these guys trying to get through like that? Greg goes, stop them. I'm like, yeah, you put your bottom dollar. I'm going to stop them. So I grab the one guy. Greg goes, get on. I go, what? And then it hits me. He's hop. He's getting on the back of the one motorcycle. I get on the other. And it was like we were going on a double date. I'm holding on to this, this guy. He's on the other motorcycle. We got all the equipment. And we're telling this guy, you know, get up to the to the bridge, zigzag through the traffic, come out onto the bridge. We drive right past the fifth precinct car. He's standing outside the car. He sees us going past. Give him a wave. We pull up. Adam eight truck eight boy eight. They're all there. They're actually making their way up, you know, onto the cables. And they see us. And they just start laughing. We get off the bike. Thanks, guys. And the guys race off. You know, now they got nobody. They just race back into Brooklyn, wherever they were going. Very funny. Too many funny ones. I don't I don't want to I could have you here till eight o'clock. The funny jobs. The funny stuff. Bobby you know. And Kaczynski, Paulie Kaczynski. Those two guys. Brought, I was on training. They let us out of school for a week, which is a mistake. They shouldn't have done that. But <laughs> because then you go back to the school and you don't want to, you know, you, you've right. already been in the street. You want to get back out to the street. But and for me. We got a jumper, confirmed jumper on the Williamsburg Bridge. And Kenevin Kaczynski let me suit up, get the ropes on, and walk up with them up the cable. That was awesome. You know, I mean, you know, and then they, they, Kenevin, let the kid, let the kid bring him down. So I walked the guy down, to, you know, I have a picture of it somewhere around here. But uh, yeah, so I got a taste. I was still in, in SDS and I got a bridge job. You know, some guys go a long time without getting to climb that cable. And if you stand around long enough, you'll have footprints on your back. You know, if you don't get on that bridge, you know, so um, that was a big one. One truck and eight truck used to go at it all the time. Who could get to the bridge first? <laughs> it's great. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, comp the camaraderie and the competition couldn't beat it. And, you know, to climb a bridge. Yeah. yeah. Who does that? Yeah. No. No. Extraordinary men and women. That's, that, that's who. Yeah. E men, baby. E cops. E yeah, cops. Who did it the right way? Popped the door. It was open anyway. You have to introduce ourselves. Uh, the bunker I had had no light on it, and I was using my Glock 19, which didn't have a, a light on it. So I'm looking down this dark hallway, and it's more like a, a dark hallway, and then there's like a little opening here. So you, you know it's splitting your bunker. You're covering that, that empty spot with your gun, and you're covering the unknown with your bunker. Take a couple of steps in, and a shot rings out, and it hits the bunker. It hits it right on the corner of the bunker. Now, contrary to what people think, the, the bunker is manual. It does move. So... Uh, it was, I was shot at with a Mossberg 500 12 gauge shotgun, and it had the double O buck, which is you know 32 caliber bullets. Nine come out at a time. So seven hit the bunker and two hit me. One took the tip of my nose off and one hit hit me right in the eye socket, which luckily for me it's one of the hardest bones, and I was able to crack that eye socket. Now the rest of the bullets hit the bunker, and back then we didn't have what's known as anti spalling. Second, like uh, make sure they put on. So the fragments, the, the bullet fragments shattered and then rode the bunker because the bunker moves. So that went into my face. So I, and I had bullet fragments in both my eyes and in my face. Tons. And I think I sent you a photo of the x ray. I'm going to show it momentarily. So on instinct, again, this is when we talk about training because I'm, I'm no superhero. It's just muscle memory and, and, and reflex. 
And we're taught from day in, day out that you penetrate the location, no matter what. My job is to stop the rounds. Did I know I got, you know, my bell rung? Absolutely not. I mean, uh, for all I knew, you know, Mike Tyson just punched me, you know? Yeah. So it's funny because the term we used to joke about, it's like, you know, everybody has a plan to get punched in the face. Now I know what that feels like. So instinctively, my legs went forward. And I'm literally just pulling, you know, I'm shooting down range, thinking I'm shooting down range. Didn't realize that the bullet, and I have my, I still have my department issue, Glock 19, that has a, a scrape across it where a bullet shot out of my hand. So I'm still pulling the trigger, going forward. Another round comes, boom, hits the bunker dead on. So it's like somebody with a sledgehammer taking a running start and hitting you on the sledgehammer. And again, it's a narrow hallway, and I'm a big guy. For some reason, I guess his view is from the light coming outside, which is EMS vehicles, because where we found this guy was where EMS was staged, like the safe area. So all you saw was the occasional lights of the EMS you know, vehicles. So third shot misses me completely. Hits, uh, hits uh, the wall, all nine shots. Fourth shot again, hits the bunker, boom, right on top. And I'm literally, I'm not knowing this because I'm blind. I'm just going on muscle memory. I'm just going forward. I'm literally on top of the guy, not knowing it. So he puts the shotgun to my leg and fires. And luckily, I had my gas mask strapped to my, uh, to my leg. On my, on my left leg and the gas mask has like a little kevlar net that comes over when you put it on it's like the same scott pack that you see on, on the firemen use and that stopped some of the rounds so five penetrated my leg right to the bone and i finally went down and then uh, i remember trying really hard not to lose consciousness and i could hear this guy like in a panic just walking around and I'm literally like reaching, I'm old school Bronx boy. I'm, I'm reaching for, I had a buck knife. I'm like, I'm going to stab this guy. <laughs> you know, he gets near me. Because uh, I thought he was going to finish me off. I, I didn't hear him load the gun though. That's why, that's why I was like, okay, this guy, you know, I, I, I could like, I could literally like smell this guy, even though like, you know, the tip of my nose was a buzz. And then he ran into the back. And then uh, I had a little experience. Uh, my grandfather came to me in a vision and told me, you want to live, want to die? And I was like, yeah, I want to live. So I had gotten on the radio and, and I said, listen, guys, I'm down. Can someone get me? Now, meanwhile, there's a gun battle going on now in the backyard. Now I'm hearing shots. And at the time, it was Santos Valentin's guy, rest his soul. He was, he was killed on 9-11. He recognized my voice. And he's like, hey, Big Joe is down. Big Joe is down. And apparently that's when you know, a bunch of guys came in to, uh, to rescue me and, and drag me out of there. Uh, what I didn't know behind me was that uh, one of the rounds ricocheted off my bunker and hit Jimmy McGrath right, across, right between the eyes. Luckily, it didn't penetrate his skull, but it, it ripped him open. So, and then Billy Madigan saved him. And uh, and then Billy Madigan came back with, uh, I think it was like Vic Holyfield and a bunch of other guys. And they came and they, they pulled me out from what, you know, from what I was told. I can't say what happened behind me because I wasn't there. I do know that the, I had a new guy behind me. And this is, again, when I talk about training. Um, and it's not a popular thing. He, he, he ran. You know, he, didn't, he, he should have never been in emergency service. He had a Mini-14, because I remember ducking, thinking that the, the, the Mini-14 is going to go off, and it never did. And that's where Jimmy stepped up, and then Jimmy uh, got tagged, because the kid pushed past everybody. And the same thing with the Sergeant Griffin. He ran across the street, apparently. So, it, you know, this is the thing about uh, this job, is that this job is not for everybody. And they're not all perfect. But some people are just are not made to be in this unit. And it's, it, it pains me to say that, but it, it, it's the truth, and that's how we learn. Yeah. So, you know, then the, the, the whole rescue uh, afterwards, then now they're working on me and I could feel the raindrops falling into my face because it's raining. And uh, apparently somebody let uh, a round almost hit me. It turned out that it was, again, Sergeant Griff let a round go and almost hit me. So they took his gun away and they could put me into a, an R&P because I'm a big guy. And it was, uh, oh, gosh, uh, what's his name? Big Asian guy. I, I, I love this guy. He's uh, not so bad with names. Uh, it'll come to me. Dave Cave. Dave Kale, uh, he's a real knowledge, but he's a PA actually now in medicine. He put me in the back of an ambulance because a bunch of guys from crime scene detectives uh, broke into an ambulance that was abandoned by EMS because they ran when the shots rang out. And mind you, there's a gun battle going on in the backyard. Yeah, them I don't blame. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't blame them at all. So they broke into the ambulance and they put me in the ambulance and they're driving me to... Uh, to Kings County Hospital, even though Coney Island Hospital is right across the street, but uh, that's not a that's not a trauma center you want to go to. Uh, so I don't even know it's a trauma center. They're just like, hey, we're taking you to Kings County because that's where 
you know, the, the, apparently the best surgeons are. And, and they were right. I, I'm not a Brooklyn guy, so I don't know anything about Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, you try to find humor and everything. And, uh, and, and K.O. is talking to me, you know, he's patching me up and stuff. And he's like, Joe, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And he has like a weird accent. I don't know what it is, but it's just, he's a funny guy. He's, I mean, I, I love this guy. And uh, he's talking to me like, you're going to be fine. Gonna... Meanwhile, he didn't realize he's leading into me and his radio is right by my ear. So I'm here and there. Start off the blood bank. The officer's likely. I'm like, hey, I'm like, Dave, you're lying to me. They're telling me I'm going to die. It's okay. You know, and I'm like, I'm going to be assuring him. Like, it's okay. He's like, no, 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 don't listen to that. Whatever. It was just that whole ride. And at one point that they had to tell highway to slow it down because that ambulance became airborne. They hit a pothole or something. And I could just feel that. Boom. And I'm bouncing the back of that bus. I mean, this guy's trying to, you know, they're doing their thing to get me to the ambulance and uh, I have to get me to the hospital. And, you know, interesting stuff goes on, you know, being on that side of the fence, because I've always been at the other side where, and it's one of the sucky parts of being a ESU cop is you see, you know, the whole routine when officers get shot, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. We all go out of our way to make sure this cop makes it, you know, this is family here. And I, now I'm not the receiving end of that. I'm the one usually saving the day and how the guys are saving me. And it's, it was just like, I was actually, there was this calmness that came over me. Like I wasn't worried about anything, I guess, because I was still in La La Land. You know, I just got my bell rung, so I was just like, it was just weird how calm I was. In fact, at the time, it was Chief Dunn, a great guy, by the way. Um, he uh, He's talking, and they're, they're trying to figure out if they could land a helicopter on my property, where I live. Because they wanted to get next of kin, you know, get the wife. And uh, they thought I was unconscious, though. I'm just laying there, just, you know, they're working on me, you know, doing whatever, taking my clothes off and checking me for holes. At one point, they, you know, check my butt. I'm like, hey, dude, that hole came with me. <laughs> it's like the, and this, the whole ER started laughing. I'm like, buy me a drink or something first, you know, before you do that. Like, like, they're like, yeah, dude, oh, sorry, we have to check. I'm like, okay, whatever. And that's when Douglas goes, goes, you're, you're conscious? And I'm like, yeah, what's up? Because, I, I, again, I'm swollen and I'm, you know, it's, it's, I'm ugly to look at. And it's like, yeah, you can, you can definitely land a, a, a helicopter in my backyard, but she ain't getting in that helicopter. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's not happening. You, know, you can go to, you know, there's a hospital nearby that has a um, helipad too. And it's like, they ain't getting that in a helicopter. So don't even, don't even try that. So, but that was, yeah, that was pretty much it. And of course, now, now they, you know, they, they put me out. They had to induce a coma to reduce the damage to my eyes. And I had, uh, you know, total out of the whole year, I had 23 surgeries. Jeez. To repair damage, including you know the fully attached retina, partially attached retina, a ton of uh, little invasive stuff to, to remove, debris my my entire face. I had bullets in my gum line. And you see, I had the hardest teeth ever because they were scraping lead off my teeth. I, I didn't lose a single tooth. I never had a cavity in my life either. So that's that's I guess it's a genetic thing. My 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 father, my grandfather, never lost a tooth. Um, and uh, you know they, they had to do all different sections. I remember. Uh, Ray Ruiz from Three Truck, great guy. Another, I, I say, I mean, good guys. He was one of the guys that used to drive me to my appointments, and uh, he was like saying, "No, they're filleting you." He would sit there and watch the procedure, you know. And I said, "Dude, they were like filleting you like a fish." It was like it was it was interesting. And it turned out that my oral surgeon was the same oral surgeon for the New York Yankees. So every day, mind me, I wasn't a Yankee fan. I'm a Mets fan. And uh, right, this day, podcast I'm is over. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> It's funny because I grew up right next to Yankee Stadium. No, yeah. I, I used to love them in the 70s. After the, after the, the, the first strike, I'm like, eh. Then I moved to Flushing. But anyway, that being said, uh, every day is a new Yankee in there. So I ended up getting all this Yankee memorabilia. You know, and I gave it to my brother because he's a big diehard Yankee fan. Like Jer- Derek Jeter yeah. would come in, Joe Torre, whatever. And it was, it was it was it was interesting that whole that whole thing. But it the, the only horrible part about the shooting is that yeah, you do go through an emotional toll, you get post traumatic stress, and then you know. My biggest concern, and I kept, I asked, I said, did anybody die behind me? And they said no. And they said I broke down because that was the most important thing to me, that nobody died. You know, I did what I had to do, and I still get emotional. You know, it brings us back to a job you were telling me about off the air, and I'll get into it now. And I shout out my friend Mark Bulitz, who's tuning in tonight via LinkedIn, I know, um, for this show. You mentioned 155th in Amsterdam, where I think, yeah, he, yeah. well, I'll let you tell the story. Back then, uh, it was like the Wild Wild West up in the 3-4. And we were working take back overtime. You had the cops from all over the city coming out to help try to run the crime, you know, bring the crime down up there. 
So I already had the foot post on uh, 155th to 158th Street and uh, Broadway. So during the, it was light out. Then uh, it got dark, so I told the rookie, come on, pair up. I know this is wild over here, so this way nothing would happen. We're walking up uh, towards 156th in Amsterdam. And there was two elderly women there with a half a gallon of rum. Oh, hey, baby, you want to have a drink with us? No, nah, mama. I said, I'll come back after the end of the tour. With that, we hear two pops. And I see a, a male running across the street. He said, oh, they're shooting. Look up. There's two Spanish guys shooting at a male black leaning against a car. So... I saw I put it over three, four take back posts, so and so. Confirmed shots fired, one five six in Amsterdam. All of a sudden, the rookie I was with runs to my left, to, towards the back of the perp, perp number one. I wheeled on him. I said, "Police, don't move. Drop the gun. Drop the gun." With that, he wheels around towards the rookie. I pop him twice in the back. He goes down. The rookie lets two shots go in my direction. So now I see him down. I said, grab the gun, stay with him. Now, the other perp is running up. Uh, there was a, there's a school that goes from 155 to 156 on Amsterdam. And then there's a housing project. And there's a walkway going from Amsterdam, I think, to Bradhurst Avenue. I can't remember what the next avenue was. And so I start chasing this guy. I was going to let off a round. But I said, no. Somebody come out, and I just kept on chasing. I, I said, I don't want to hit no innocent bystander. I kept on chasing him. He jumps in the car. I put the description over the radio, and we wound up catching him about four blocks away. And uh, it was, it was, that was crazy. I was like, I was pissed off because I was supposed to take my daughter the next day to Sesame Place. I was like, damn, what was my day? <laughs> and as I'm in the area here, whoop, whoop. I said, oh, man, I tell the guy, I said, they give me the ass when I throw it in my mouth, run out to the car. He said, oh, we got a man with a gun, 56 between Broadway and 8th. Okay. Um, we get there. We don't see nothing. Since you got anything, we park the car. I tell the guy, don't get out of the car. Okay. No matter what happens, don't get out of the car. So we come back, and we're walking down the sidewalk because they're like, well, he's past McDonald's. He's in the middle of the block, male black, blah, 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 blah. He's got the gun in the bag. And as the G came out of her mouth from bag, a guy steps out of the doorway and pulls a 38 revolver. And we're about eight feet away. So he had us. He had us. Dead to right. Because he was already like, okay, there's nothing here. No, and there was construction going on. No one's pointing. No one's saying nothing. It's it's like five o'clock in the afternoon. So everybody's out and nobody's telling us nothing. Right. And then all of a sudden, this guy just walks out and he starts shooting. And Tommy got in the doorway. I looked and go, well, the two of us ain't going to fit there. My belly will be sticking out. That's for sure. So I died behind two of those construction dumpsters. And that was the big joke that anybody else, when you go to the range, they taught you how to shoot from behind a telephone pole, um, a garbage can, and a fire hydrant with the three choices that they had there permanently. Luckily, I had two nice, wide, four-foot-wide dumpsters that were together. So it, that was my cover. And... Uh, Long story short, one of the sergeants I put over the 13. Every time I came up to shoot at the guy, he's shooting at me. I'm never thinking, in between, there's a space like this and, and the, the no parking sign is there. I could just go like this and get him. But you just, you know, I, I want to come over the top and shoot. And every time I came up, it was like a shooting guy. He's shooting at me. So now I'm like, all right, this time I'm going to the side. And just as I'm going to the side, I see the sergeant is running on an angle. He, he jumped out of the car half a block away. And with one hand, throws a couple of shots and catches him in the shoulder. The guy goes down. And I'm yelling, Sarge, you can get the gun. I'll cover you. He moves. I'm, you know, just, I'm going to yell, yell, go. And I'm just going to open up on the guy. And he gets the gun. We go over, boom, boom, boom. And I grab the guy, pick him up. I'm about to give him a shot because I'm like, you know, you're so worked up. He just shot at you. I mean, your ears were ringing the whole bit. And, um, you know, then I heard the motor driver of a camera. Thank God I was around all the buffs taking pictures for years. When I heard that motor driver, I just whoop, dropped him down. That was it. Nurse from Roosevelt who recognized us, she came running up. Can I help him? I said, yeah, go right ahead. 
And uh, so then that was it. Go through, take it through court, the whole bit. Um, and the next day I finished up and went to the next roll call the next day at 4 to 12. Thanked all the guys for getting there right away. And they grabbed over, I think it was 100 witnesses. Um, and uh, the squad commander was there, the precinct commander. Uh, as I told you before, Sergeant Billy Rath, again, a great guy that you really would have to get on here. Great cop. Starting the sure. Give my number. Yep, I certainly will. Good guy. Um, you know, he was in the North as a sergeant. He had gotten the shield in the four one back in the Fort Apache days. And, uh, him and the CO ran from the station house to cut from 54th to 56th street. And, uh, the CO was as big as me and stuff like that. And he was even huffing and puffing, but he got there and he protected us to other bosses and the squads and everybody was responding. Want to talk to you? Like no one's talking to them. They're my guys. He only got there a week before he didn't know us. And, uh, but a great guy. Mayrone was his name. It just I couldn't remember it all afternoon, but it just hit me. Mayrone. He came from Staten Island. And uh, I eventually ran into him again. I think now he was a deputy chief of Manhattan North a few years later when he was in emergency. And uh, so that was it. We go through the whole thing. Now the, D, the riding DAs show up. You know, everybody's dead. It, you want to go to the hospital? No, I'm not playing that game, you know, the whole bit. And uh, so I take the collar. I go downtown. He's in the hospital. And uh, so go through the whole day. Now, the next morning, the paper is there and stuff like that. And uh, I got the paper and stuff, and there it is. Now it's on the front page. It's on the second page. And the pictures are there and a whole bit. And uh, they had the picture of the nurse uh, working on the guy and stuff, an unknown person aiding the whole thing. So I knew her from she – had, she had been a nurse that treated my partner. A couple of – Tommy Cody had fractured his ankle. And we were there half the night because you're fractured ankle. You're going to be there the whole time. Uh, we had been tra- we were chasing a perp on the west side and cut through a lot. And Tommy just hit a one of them little holes and snap. I mean, I heard the snap and take him to the hospital and the whole bit. And um, so we, uh, you know, I knew her and stuff like that. And I, so I said, I, I knew she wanted to be an actress. You know, get, get, when you're there for those many hours, you talk to them. And uh, so. You know, I called up the post the next day and I said, hey, listen, this is her name. She works at Roosevelt Hospital. She's looking to be an actress. She could lo- use a little fame there or put in her portfolio or whatever. And uh, so sure enough, the next day, and that's all part of it, uh, I, I went out. When I finally got home, went out, told my wife, and we were living with my in-laws in, in Seaford here. And um, so, you know, I get up and I put my jacket. Where are you going? I says, I'm going out to have a drink. I said, it was a pretty crazy day yesterday, you know? So I go out and I get a half a load on, but I stayed in Belrose where I uh, grew up at my mom's house. And next thing you know, it's like six in the morning and then come hear the front door open. I'm sleeping on the couch. My wife comes in and she's nine months pregnant and late already and stuff. And my father was with her. I said, what are you doing? She goes, I'm in labor. I said, well, I'm drunk. So you're going to have to wait a little bit, you know? So you know, I had some coffee. I wake up. My father was there, and he was working the night that everything was involved. So I tell him the whole thing. And now I'm sobering up really good. And, you know, I actually had slept quite a bit. And we took off, go to NY, drive into Manhattan to NYU, and go in there. And my daughter was only born 11 months before and stuff. And uh, uh, so now we go in, and I'm, like, falling asleep in the chair and stuff. And I got the newspapers. And now it's like that day when the girl is identified and the, the story's in the paper again. And she goes, man, she goes, what did they do? Get you off at midnight or something? Are you tired? I said, no, nah, Doc, I've been up for like the last two days. I said, here, you can read about it. And she was like, what? I said, yeah. I said, the shooting that happened in Midtown the other day, because it was on TV. It was live from the scene, all that stuff. You know, it's Midtown, and it's, you know, it happens at 5 o'clock at night. It's perfect for the 6 o'clock news. So everybody saw it and stuff. And she goes, oh, my God. She goes, when did you tell John? I said, well, I told him last night. She goes, well, did she go into labor then? I said, no. I says, I left and went out, had a couple of drinks and stuff. And I said, she came into my parents' house at 6 o'clock this morning. So a few hours later, my son Patrick was born, not wood. Um, the DA, when uh, we, you know, of course, we took off. My partner Tommy's daughter was born, I think, two days after that. So we weren't at work for like five days. So now it's coming up on the what they call the 180 days and stuff, like 180 hours. You have to indict somebody and they got to let them go. And the guy shot us and he had a 38. So, you know, they want to charge him. So we get in there. Hey, the DA's been calling. I go, yeah. I said, Tommy had a, you know, baby girl. I had a baby boy. I said, you know, no, no, no. But you got to go. It's a must appear. They've been calling every day. 
you know, the whole bit. And uh, my family knew if not to answer the phone or if it was police. No, he's not here, you know. And um, so, uh, you know, go down to court. You know what we were doing? I go, whoa, whoa. I said, man, I said, I had a baby boy four days ago. Tommy had a baby girl three days ago. What? And she started, she got very upset. She's like, are you kidding me? Oh, my God. She says, if you guys would have got killed by that guy, your two kids would have never met you. She was, I think that got her more than anything else. And she took that case to the limit. But the problem was he, he was found criminally insane in like 1968, was in an institute. He was institutionalized for a long time. And eventually he was let out. Okay. He's okay now. Somewhere he found a gun and it all happened. You know, that was it. But he, he ended up, uh, he was in Manhattan State Hospital for many times. Every 30 days we would be hearing. I would get notified of it just that it was happening, not that I would go there or anything like that. But finally they stopped uh, sending the thing to me. I ran it to her. She's now a judge up in the Bronx. Um, and uh, she was very good. She followed all the way through. And then, uh, like I said, uh, when I get to it later, she comes into the scene later on with an emergency. But, you know, that was it. Depending on what week it was, what what tour, you would work with all these guys, and I tried. My my thing was, you watch, you see, and then you apply. Okay, the good things you keep, the bad things you discard, and then by the end of a certain amount of time, you got a bag of tricks like Felix the Cat, and that's <laughs> that that's that's how I. Uh, did things. I watched, I looked, and then I applied. And I was good with, uh, I may not be able to do things right away, but once you taught me how to do it, I was, I, I picked it up pretty quick. And uh, you, you just have to apply those things and and have a sense in uh, maybe this would be the, the wet, right way to go. There were certain jobs that you have to do it this way, like elevator job. First thing you do is turn the power off, okay? Some would say you, you, you uh, press the button to see if it's working. But if people are already calling, you're getting four or five calls that the elevator's out, you know it's not working. So you go turn the power off, and then you, you figure out what you're going to do past that. Hmm. But like I said, the guys <clears throat> in one truck, I was very blessed to work with real good guys. I went to the truck out of my SDS class with five or six guys, and we all got scattered amongst the different squads. But then after a certain amount of time, you got to work with everybody, and it was a great thing. You always knew when you first, Miss, uh, Sergeant Casey made sure that we all knew that you're not going to touch a gun until he felt that you were uh, worthy and then he could trust you. So you always had the tools. I learned how to uh, get get into doors and, and wrap doors down, use the, the uh, battering ram. Plus, you also learned how to spin cylinders and open pick locks. Uh, Carl Russo was a guy in six truck who used to do uh, STS refreshers, and he taught all of us how to uh, work the, uh, the uh, lock pick uh, set. It was great because then when you were finished with the job, you were able to secure the door back. You didn't have to damage it. And the, the, the key was you got called by the cops because they needed your help. Now, after the job's over, you want to be able to secure the property so that they don't have to stand there because they're going to say, what did I call this guy for If when, when they're done? They leave me with a mess. So you try to finesse, finesse things. Sometimes it couldn't be, it couldn't be helped. But if you could finesse things, it made for a better so result. So getting down there, and this is the interesting part about emergency. So many guys who had left went back in to help out. Pete came, Connelly, who mentioned it on this show, he came back. You came back. Jack Cambria came back. I think Patty McGee, he had retired, like, what, the week before, right? You have that correct? I don't remember. I don't know. But maybe I, he did. I don't know. I think he did. And he came right back, if I'm not mistaken. If I have that mistaken, somebody in the chat, please correct me, Sada, because I don't want to get that wrong, obviously. But 
all these guys that had left DSU and had moved on, I'm not going to say the greener pastures, but it moved on to other endeavors, come back, and there you were. And obviously, no one Ronnie, no one San, no one Rodney. You were very close with Rodney. Rodney was very a top close. Was a sergeant. You named one Rodney of your sons. Rodney was in the SDS class. So he was one of my best friends there. Yeah. No, nah, absolutely. I named he, my he, son after him. His middle name, right? I think yeah. is Gillis. Matthew yeah. Francis Gillis Martinez. Yeah. yeah. So here's a situation where, you know, you're looking for 14 guys. And from the newest man, which was Brian McDonald, who got to ESU right after you had left, uh, came out of the STS, I think that July, to the senior guys who had been like Ronnie, like Santos, Rodney, John Delera, you know, guys that had a lot of time in that unit, Mike Curtin, um, looking for them, finding them. It was a rough time to work that pile because it's not just them. It's the civilians that are missing in there, the Port Authority cops, the firemen, too, who suffered the most losses that day. What kept you going, man? My love for these people. They were my brothers. I wanted to find, I think we all wanted to find some sort of remnants of them there. And, we, you know, we went through our periods of, of depression. And I, to me, the most interesting thing was, watching the dogs, the service dogs, the rescue dogs. Because I used to talk to the handlers every now and then. And they would ask us to bury ourselves in, in some debris so that the dog would get a positive hit and find somebody because the dogs would go through depression. And that would bring them back. That would motivate them to continue. And believe it or not, I, I think we were the same. We needed something to, we had to do something positive to find something positive, you know, to feel like we, we accomplished something that we were able to, to bring closure. And, uh, that was, that was a big thing. It was a really big thing. And unfortunately, you know, we really never found many of our own, you know, but that's, I, I, I remember when it happened and I, I went to Chief Harnett, who was the chief of the, uh, Intel. Eddie, love that guy. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie. Did you ever interview him? I did, yeah. Great guy. Oh, man. Awesome, awesome boss. And I asked him, I said, you know, I asked him if I would, if he would let me go back to ESU. I said, I got to go. I got to find my friends, you know. And he says, absolutely. He says, but there was a stipulation with it, and the stipulation was that when it was all done and said that I would come back to Intel. And I said, yeah, okay, you know, and he let me go. And he was such a gentleman that he actually promoted me to detective while I was back in the hole, back in ESU, which was, I, I didn't expect to get promoted in a long time, but he promoted me. And, uh, but I had to go back. I had to go back. Those were my brothers. Those were my best friends, you know. Those were guys that I'd seen the best and the worst with. And they were my heroes. Because I guarantee you not one of them, not one of them like anybody in this unit would have thought about their lives when they went into that building. First, the most uplifting job that you, Jerry Kozlowski, has ever responded to in either housing or the NYPD? Uplifting job. It, it's going to sound weird, but I, I'm i an animal lover. I like dogs, especially. That makes two of us. Yeah, and um, we were doing, myself and Dan Donnelly, we were doing, uh, Clinton was in when he was president, and there was a job up in Upper Manhattan, and it was a dog that fell between two buildings and the buildings were shaped like a V. So the dog, the woman took the dog up to walk on the roofs and he went down, he was stuck there. And on the way back to the truck, Hey, let's go over there. You know, it's, it sounds like a pretty active job. And we got over there and, um, Joe Ocasio and, um, trying to think who else went over Regina McGee. They went over the side. Heard her. Juan Garcia said, you guys going over? Go. And uh, we're trying to get this dog out. Meanwhile, they sedate the dog. Long story short, 
I'm up on the roof and they have the rope around the dog and I'm yanking. I'm trying to yank him. I'm yanking. Dog's not budging. I said, wait a minute. They said, gonna send one of the cops down to the bodega and get a gallon of oil. So they go down and get a gallon of oil poured on the dog. Working, working, working the dog. Dog finally comes out. I felt great. We saved the dog. They matter just as much was, as humans do. Yeah, yeah. I had, I had good feelings, you know, and being around when a baby's born or something or uh, doing CPR on somebody, which that happened in Manhattan uh, when I was with Joe Ocasio on two truck. Guy had a cardiac at the boathouse. We went down. We're working on the guy, working on the guy, and finally I do CPR. And we step back, and then you see his neck pumping. We brought him back. Yeah, it is. There was a few, but that was two of them. And I'm sure in those moments, that's what made you say, "Man, I am really glad I took this job." Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. For as many for as many days that can make you on the NYPD and by extension the FDNY go home with a sad look on your face, there's just as many days that can make you go home with a smile. And there are two instances right there. So love that. Thank you. Um, 18 years, even though I'm sure you would have rather left on happier terms and maybe you would have liked to have gone longer, at least 20, maybe even 25. When you look back, there's a lot to be proud of. I mean, there are some people that never get the chance to do the job at all. They end up on the waiting list. They never get on. Things happen. Circumstances happen. So do you at least look back at those 18 years and say, wow, I got to do the job. And not only did I get to do the job, Look, look at the units you worked in, rescue and transit, ESU and the NYPD. It's a lot to be proud of, Joe. It is. It is. And 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 and, and frankly speaking, uh, I would have stood there until, uh, what was it, 61? Were 63. You? I would have stood there till, till 63. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. I would have I would stood there to the very end. The, the, um, the thing with my... Uh, uh, Early dismissal from the job wasn't my doing. The department surgeon said to me, I'm putting you out. And I thought I made that decision. He goes, you're not. I'm making it. I'm putting you out. I go, I don't want to go out. And we're going back and forth. We're going back and forth. You know, I didn't want to leave. Okay. I'm sure like every E-man, they enjoy the job. They take pride in what they do. Uh, and rightfully so. I did not want to leave. I even called the PBA. I called the union and this is no, he's putting you out, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, and then cause after a while you come to your senses. Okay. You know, uh, but I would have been there to the very end to, to the, uh, the age where you had to leave. I would have been there, you know, no doubt. You know, if you ask me, what would I, would I be able to go back tomorrow? Would I do it? Yes. Without a doubt. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we're older now, but oh yeah, I have no 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 second thoughts. Yeah, you know, you take pride in what you do, and the, every E man takes pride in what they've done, and I'm sure of that. And uh, it's something that you just—it's just not a nine to five job, okay? You've come across just about every walk and talk of people on this earth. Uh, and you've helped people along the ways, and that's what makes an officer, whether you're ESU or patrol, you have attained so much stuff. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable, you know? It's unbelievable. But I'm sure everybody, regardless of their position in, in the NYPD or any law enforcement, people take pride in what they do. Regardless of what's going on out there, you know? Guys do the job because that's what they love to do, you know. And I'm sure anyone who did law enforcement, uh, minus today, but I'm sure the guys are, are very proud of what they've done in the past. And I believe it's our responsibility to make sure you didn't have a guy working 45 hours in a row, even if you even if he or she wanted to. They shouldn't be working that long in a row. But that's, I think, the time when like when wellness comes into play and making sure guy you know guys are kind of taking care of themselves um, because they'll never tell you they're tired. They'll never tell you that. They've had they've been standing for so long. They'll never tell you they're thirsty. They'll they'll say everything's fine. So it's game. it's on us. They are, but it's on us to kind of make sure that we're taking care of them so they can, you know, go home in the same condition they, they arrived to us in. 
Mm, of course. And with these parades, it's especially interesting, too, because I'll, I'll extend it for you guys and the bomb squad, really, as well as counterterrorism. And now with the strategic response group, it's really through the end of the year because you have the parades. This past year, the Yankees and Mets had playoff games. There's 30 Rock Tree Light. Right. And then you top it off, of course, on December 31st in Times Square. The planning for that is so extensive and so exhaustive, but you guys make it look so easy, which I've always marveled at. Yeah, you, well, you know what, Mike? You, you kind of go with I, I like to say whenever there's a, a detail in, in, in Times Square for New Year's Eve, it's not like it's the first time we've done it. So you kind of just dust off last year as you see like what worked, what didn't, and then kind of modify from there. Um, so ideally, that's how it should work. When it doesn't work, it's because whoever it is that's grabbing that plan says they, they'd rather try something else. I don't think that's a great idea. I think you should just at least start from a, from a base of knowledge, um, at least until something goes wrong. But it, it is it is from from August to September is the, is, the, is the Super Bowl of of ESU and then again through the you know Halloween parade Thanksgiving Day parade New Year's Eve is is also a busy season for the for the for the unit. No, of course. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You guys have never had a major catastrophe at these incidents, and if it st stays that way or, or has stayed that way for all these years, what's the point? And that leadership it? has to understand, especially in emergency services. Okay, a lot of those sergeants and lieutenants that you've been talking about, they're E men. Those guys, they understand. The problem that you see in, t in today's day and age, unfortunately, is you can't just put a boss into a unit like emergency services. You have to be a cop there first. You have to understand what it is we do. You also have to understand, if you're a, the entry-level boss, as I call it, a sergeant, you have to understand that on any given night, you could be my partner. And I'm not talking to you like a sergeant. I respect your rank. But I'm talking to you as my partner because we may be truck only and we're running around. So if we have to do some grunt work, there is, well, I'm, the, I'm a sergeant. I'm not lifting that ladder. No, it doesn't work that way. That's not what ESU is about. And those guys that you're talking about, okay, like Billy Kennedy is one. He's the first guy to pick up the ladder, you know, because that's who he is. That's, that's an E-man there. And that's what, in order for our unit to succeed, you have to constantly pound that into people's heads. We respect rank. All cops respect the rank in the issue. But there's a camaraderie. We are one. That's who we are. doesn't matter if you're a sergeant, lieutenant, who you are. We are one. And if we operate as a one, we're going to get the mission accomplished. 20 years, a lot to be proud of. Transit police, that was a lot of fun, especially at EMRU and the rescue unit. And obviously the last six years in emergency service. You know, hi, what are you proudest of in your career? Well, you know, again, uh, I was very fortunate. I had a guardian angel probably looking over me. And uh, you look back at some of the things you did, some of the risks that you took with, uh, you know, your, your partners and whatnot, um, and some of the things that we did. And you say to yourself, wow, it wouldn't have taken much for that to go the wrong way. Right. Um, so, you know, I look back at that. But one of the, one of the redeeming uh, uh features of my life and my career have been my my post 9-11 career has kept me uh, busy and constantly uh, working with and bumping into guys that I, guys and gals and when I say guys I mean everybody um, working with and, and, and getting uh, doing things uh, with with guys that have been retired uh, came through PD, emergency service, transit, whatever the case may be. And we, so many, so many of the, in, in fact, Johnny Lampkin is one of the names. I think you've uh, uh, interviewed uh, Kenny Winkler yep, and, and so many others. We, our paths have probably crossed as much now in retirement and working in our own uh, areas than when we were probably uh, on the job together. So uh, what's great is, you can go to a you can go to a meeting, a hundred people, and you can find the one guy that hey, or the one gal that you were on the job. Yeah, okay, blah blah blah, and you start reminiscing, and then you realize who they were. And uh, so I find that that's been uh, it's been a great uh, part of a, a great success of my uh, my my success of what I've been doing uh, since uh, I left the job, and uh, it's worked out well for uh, for everybody. That uh, there's that that you know, quiet network out there. Um, the guys are still involved in different things, different agencies, different businesses. And whether you're getting a phone call or a text, 
Um, you know, do you know somebody that knows somebody who knows somebody? Yeah, I do. You know, or yeah, you know, you're doing the same thing for them. Hey, I need this or I need that. All right, give me a day. I'll get back to you. So right. it's a great network. It's a great brotherhood, sisterhood uh, that we've had um, over the years. And uh, it's great that we still have guys uh, that are still on the job that, uh, you know, keep, keep the flame burning. And again, like I said earlier, the Retired Emergency Man's Association um, is, again, I, I run into guys that retired when, before I came on the job. And that's, that's like an amazing, you know, amazing longevity, you know, right. testament to that. Of course. No, and I'm a member of Rima, and, I, and I'm very thankful for that. And I think I can say this now that we've hit volume 30 of this miniseries. And I know I've said this before, and I apologize if I sound like a broken record to the audience. But I appreciate you guys peeling back the curtain for me and allowing me a glimpse into and all the guys from ESU, NYPD, from housing rescue, from transit rescue, you know, giving me a look inside. Well, as you just said, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, because I get it. I'm an outsider. But you guys have welcomed me with open arms, and I really do appreciate that because I genuinely do love the history of the unit, well, the department as a whole, but especially that unit. And to have gotten to have chronicled, chronicled so many of you guys over the last year or so and hear the different stories of the different trucks and the many amazing jobs you guys have had, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a real blessing. It's, it's not really much more I could say to sum it up, but, man, you know, I, I've, I've seen that camaraderie, and it's, it's a great thing to behold. You hit the nail on the head. The uh, DOA, some kind of uh, victim to a burning, whether it was an aerosol can or another flammable liquid. He's burnt, but he's not burnt beyond recognition, and there's no burn marks around the grass. So my uh, opinion is that it didn't happen right there. My greatest fear on the job is not going home to my kids and family. I did a lot of things that I look back at I shouldn't have done, but I don't leave my house in a fight with my kids because I might not come home. I don't want that feeling that something happens to me and my kids saying, oh, I wish I didn't fight with daddy before that happened. So I hug my kids, kiss them. If they're asleep, I'll just give them a kiss. Maybe they don't know I did it, but it's an inside thing I have to do. Good day's work. Oh, yeah. We got the guy, nobody got hurt. It's a good day's work.